Time for Mac Break Weekly. We're getting ready for WWDC. Renee Ritchie, Andy Anako, and Serenity Caldwell are here to talk about Apple's new music endeavors, the new Apple TV, what might it include, iOS 9, OS 10, 10.11. It's all coming up next on Mac Break Weekly. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for MacBreak Weekly is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is MacBreak Weekly, episode 457, recorded Tuesday, June 2nd, 2015. Mac Pro for sale. MacBreak Weekly is brought to you by Gazelle, the fast and simple way to sell your used gadgets. Find out what your used iPhone, iPad, or other Apple product is worth at gazelle.com. And by NatureBox. NatureBox ships tasty, guilt-free snacks right to your door with over 100 flavors to choose from, like mini Belgian waffles. You'll never get bored of snacking again. Try NatureBox at naturebox.com slash twit. That's naturebox.com slash twit. And by lynda.com the online learning platform with over 3,000 on-demand video courses to help you strengthen your business, technology, and creative skills for a free 10-day trial. Visit lynda.com slash MacBreak. That's L-Y-N-D-A dot com slash MacBreak. It's time for MacBreak Weekly, the show where we cover the latest Apple news. And it's our yearly pre-WWDC issue Andy Anako is here from the Chicago Sun Times. Good to see you, Mr. I. Good to see you too, Leo. You will be. Uh, I just found out uh, joining us for our uh, coverage of the keynote on Indeed. Monday. Indeed, I'm doing. I'm doing like three different keynotes in a row, all of which like from my from my bat, my Millennium Falcon flight deck of four different screens. Uh, this is too too many in one in a too many in a three week period. Yeah, we just had Google I/O. What else is coming up? Uh, big uh, tech at, at uh, uh, I even forgot the name of it. Uh, there's a big show in Asia that's going on where ah. Asus just uh, showed off a whole bunch of stuff. Oh, and Computex. Other, uh, yeah. Computex, yeah. thank you very much. Uh, and also all that uh, stuff that we're going to be talking about, about uh, the new Thunderbolt and stuff from Intel. Home and kit. And, holy it cow. was really, really, it's, it's, a good, it's a good week to be sitting in your own office. Doing yeah, that. see, I feel like that, uh, you know, people often uh, think, oh, you really want to be at the event. And you don't, you can't really do as much from the event well, as you can do if you're sitting in the cockpit. Well, sometimes sometimes you do. I mean, especially at an Apple event where it's just as important to both get the temperature of the crowd in a live setting, and also there there's if you have had experience, then there are things that you do outside of the actual keynote, whether you have formal briefings privately with Apple or you happen to see someone that you know and they're willing to have a conversation with yes. you that you're not yes. that you can't quote anybody from. That's so useful it's, it's, it's for valuable. you ink stained wretches, but for us broadcast <laughs> types. So sometimes though it's sometimes though you do have to uh, if if you don't have like a big travel budget, you have to ask yourself, okay, I'm going to spend $1100 to be in San Francisco for for three and a half days. What am I going to get out of that? And right. sometimes it's like, yeah, I will lose some stuff, but I will have $1100 in my well, pocket for which I can buy whatever they're going to announce there. I feel like that's why we have the wonderful Rene Ritchie from iMore.com. He's going down there. Yes, he, sir. He's going down, Rene. He's, he's going down. He'll be, he'll be, uh, and people are saying, what keynote? Mo <laughs> Monday, 10 a.m. Pacific, uh, 1 p.m. <laughs> Eastern time, 1700 UTC, WWDC. And uh, we're going to talk about what kind of announcements Apple will have at its Worldwide Developers Conference. Apparently uh, it's the 2015th edition of the <laughs> Yes. It's amazing. Since the year zero. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and also, maybe down with you, maybe in your briefcase, we're not sure, with Serenity Caldwell from iMore. Hi, Serenity. Hello. <laughs> it's harder. It's harder. Well, I guess you guys are on the East Coast, so you got a long flight. It's a long way to go. We do. Uh, for me, it's always worth it. I mean, I spent several years in San Francisco when I was first starting out, and I have a lot of friends there. So yeah. on that note, it's like it's nice to go and see everybody. But also, uh, like Renee was saying, WWDC is so much more than the actual conference these days. That it's a it's very easy to justify the the six hour flight and the plane ticket at but the expense of basically getting to spend an entire week with really awesome people. But you get you like all the other uh, press get thrown out after the keynote, right? You can't stick around for the conference. Yeah, um, usually that's true. Um, in the past, I know Jason Snell has uh, been able to uh -huh. 
spend the week and cover from a from a non NDA perspective uh, the the conference sort of to but that's not necessarily the norm. I think that that might be a shift of Apple changing forward where they are letting some journalists cover uh, cover the keynote as a whole. But in generally also, uh, I mean, have you have you been to the, the, the full conference in years past, Leo? No, I was always yeah. kicked out, right? Yeah, I would love so, to. Are you kidding? Yeah, yeah I paid really my 99 bucks. <laughs> <laughs> it's fascinating. And it's definitely worth the $1,600 to have face-to-face -face access with engineers. Um, I went a couple years back for the full conference and being able to interact with all of those people one-on-one um, -on -one and talk to people who you may, ne you know, you may never get to talk to on an email chain uh, to help troubleshoot and help work with your things. But also the sessions are extremely valuable. Now, oh, most I of bet. them are now available online for free, which is really awesome. Uh. Um, and that gives, you know, that, that gives developers who have paid their $99 but aren't necessarily able to make a flight out to San Francisco most of the information that's covered at the conference. But there, I, I really feel like the face-to-face -face interaction and the fact that there are all these people from all over the world converging on San Francisco for a week, that's the special part of it. Yeah, I mean, like the parties and stuff. <laughs> oh, Hanging yeah. out at Starbucks. <laughs> yeah. It's the, the weird thing. I feel like uh, the one of the one of the best apps... Uh, actually, the one of the best apps that we use it at iMore repeatedly is a is a little app called Napkin, just written by a, a couple of friend of friends of ours. Right. And I I was sitting in a, a cafe uh, that just makes sandwiches right across the street from Moscone when they came up with the idea. Oh, wow. And so it's really That's fun cool. to be able to trace that and be really like that was that happened like four years ago did or they five write, years ago. Did they write it on the back of a napkin? The idea? Because that would be. <laughs> you know, I don't remember. I think it was a notebook, but it would be very poetic. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't part of the problem, though, that if you do stay for the rest of the uh, uh, schedule, you are under heavy non-disclosure? Um, again, yes, but uh, less so in, in than in recent years. Huh? It used to okay. be that anything outside of the keynote was, you know, off limits. That you couldn't mention it on Twitter. You couldn't blog about it if you were a reporter going um, who had bought a full conference ticket. Now it's a little bit. F more flexible. Um, now you can even, you know, you can talk about uh, the developer betas, but Apple's big thing still is they don't want screenshots and they don't want reviews. So they basically are saying, you know, we're, we're a little bit more okay of you talking about the stuff that we're prepping um, for the fall and the stuff that we're working on from the developer side. But we'd really appreciate if you don't say to the public, this is how it's looking in its final form. <laughs> And this is what I think about. This is so awful because a lot can change between June and September. I've been on those beta circles for several years now. And the amount that changes and the stability differences are, are vast in those couple of months. Yeah, and that, that's absolutely true. Apple has really changed over the past, I'd say, four years regarding how tightly they lock down information from, from WWDC. Uh, even stuff that you can get just as a member of the developer program. It used to be a very, I, I, I had to, I was able to change my policy of not participating in the beta program because of the strict, the strict uh, controls Apple puts on what you can do with the information that you glean from having early access to the next iOS or the new Mac OS. Now there's sort of a, so long as you follow a general no harm done rule, so long as you're not, like Sonny already said, so long as you're not reviewing it, uh, they're 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 not willing to really get on your back about uh, what you learned from the betas, and I I think that the closest th that we have to the old fashioned Mac World Expos is WWDC, where it's not just the stuff that's on the schedule and the stuff that you get by actually attending the event. It's the fact that here is for whatever reason, whether it's for WWDC or whatever, you have thousands of people who are in the Mac and iOS communities coming to the same city at the same time. So that is an excellent time that even if you don't have a ticket to WWDC, even if you don't attend the keynote, you will have opportunities to meet up with all kinds of people, sometimes two or three uh, at a time during a lunch. And that's a time where Again, you can have there are questions that you can ask and information that you can get and deeper knowledge that you can glean uh, from having just a good breakfast with a couple of people or, or, or a cup of tea on that roof garden at the Yerba Buena Gardens than you can by spending two hours inside uh, inside the actual event itself. So it's, it can be very, very valuable. Well, we'll do our best to bring it to you live. And Apple's already uh, put up information about their live stream and updated the uh, uh, Apple TV, too. So there's the Apple Events app, which you probably have. Um, and uh, if you have that on your Apple TV, you'll be able to watch the stream there. But if you want our commentary, 
Mike Elgin, Andy Anako, um, we're not myself and maybe some others. Uh, please uh, tune in 10 a.m. on Monday, 10 a.m. Pacific, 1 p.m. Eastern Time, 1700 UTC for live coverage of WWDC. Actually, before we talk about WWDC, I think it's worth saying that there's some home kit stuff happened today. And in fact, Serenity has been already hard at work all morning <laughs> testing some of this. So there's new hardware. There is. Uh, after, you know, it's been just about a year since Apple announced HomeKit uh, at last WWDC, actually. And throughout that year, uh, manufacturers and third-party accessory makers have been busy at work getting their stuff certified and ready to actually launch. Uh, we saw some devices at CES, um, including some stuff from Insopio and a couple other uh, manufacturers. But as of today, as of June 2nd, there are actual HomeKit devices in stores, on the market, and available for pre-order with a lot more coming soon. Now, I think there are, uh, Renee, correct me if I'm wrong, there are five to start off with. Yep. Um, we collected, including the Echo B3 thermostat, um, a couple of, I forget what, the the central hub, I think it's Intion central hub. In um, Instion, and yeah. Instion, Instion yeah. there we go. I, I missed the T. Um, Instion, as well as um, the Luan Cassetta, which is the one that I have been testing. That was that was the one that was available in the Apple Store today. So I drove over to the Apple no Store in Providence. No kidding. Wow. <laughs> yeah. 10 a.m. I walk in He's right the after they open the doors and I'm like, hey. That's dedication. So, yeah, I, I went up to their manager. I felt kind of bad. I was like, so here's the deal. You probably don't have this on your shelves yet. You probably don't even know it exists. Oh, no, we have one in the back, back of, here. Let me get it for yeah, you. Yeah, our back of house. Yeah. He was like, let me go talk to my guy. And then he came out. He's like, I didn't even know we had these. Well, it just came in. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So this so, is a company called uh, this probably well known to most people who do this kind of thing Lutron, Lutron and yes. uh, it's called Caseta and it's for wireless lighting specifically right it doesn't does it do anything besides lighting yeah so it does wireless lighting and blinds uh, and it also hooks up with a couple of thermostats ah. um in cool at least in the in the app it says that it works with both the Honeywell and the Nest I'm oh, going nice. to try it I'm going to try out the Nest later later today we'll see if the Nest works with Siri Fingers crossed. That would be cool. Uh, but this but yeah, is what I we always talk about in the uh, in the um, smart things ad, which is okay. So now you've got your lights and blinds, and maybe your thermostat. But that's mm -hmm. another app on your phone, and then there's another app. So does HomeKit kind of eliminate that? Is Apple becoming the hub that talks to all these things? Yeah, that's the general idea. Uh, so you still need the individual apps to set up those devices. They all have their own, of course, you know, there's various right. pairing and you still have to hook up a hub to your Ethernet router. Um, but once you've gotten it set up and once you've set up the names of these apps and what rooms they belong to, then it hooks into this central HomeKit uh, Siri system. Um, so I, I actually just finished an article on how to use Siri with your HomeKit accessories. And basically, once you set up your HomeKit accessories, you can put them into rooms and zones that Siri recognizes. Uh, so for instance, um, my my Lutron here that's, that's loading, um, I have got uh, a couple different setups for rooms and zones. I've got two rooms called the Space Shuttle and the Rec Room, respectively. You have a Space um, Shuttle in your apartment? <laughs> I so do. So cool. <laughs> I do. I can't have it's, a hot plate in my apartment. <laughs> <laughs> or the benefits kettle. of Boston. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so I, you can name them anything, which is really fun. Uh, yeah. Renee, of course, has been joking for years that he wants a crash the compound. And sadly, that doesn't quite work. Um, Siri does require that you say turn on, turn off, oh. dim, or set to a certain number or percentage. So it's not that cool, but you can still use custom names. So if I... You know, if I get on Siri here, I think this one is. You can say, space turn shuttle. on the space shuttle. Yeah. Yeah. Turn on the space shuttle. Oh, oh, oh. Wow. Yeah. That's nice. It did. It worked. That's or the. I have seen so many of these. Dim demos. the space shuttle to 65. That might not work. Oh. Okay. Yeah, it did. I set the space shuttle light to 65. Turn off the space shuttle. Okay. Nice. Turn yeah. Off. And then you can, so that's, so that's the individual room and the room can be multiple devices, including lights, including blinds, including thermostats. 
Um, and you can set scenes. I don't think, I haven't been able to make scenes uh, work with Siri yet. I think it's just set up to use rooms and zones. But in theory, uh, especially since HomeKit and the HomeKit devices support programmable scenes, I'm kind of hoping that in the future, you'll be able to be like, set the lights to 65 when I leave my house and it'll be able to combine geofencing with that. It doesn't do that yet, but I, I kind of wish it would. Yeah. One, the one major bummer besides that as well is that if I go, you know. She's talking to her watch now, folks. Yeah, I am talking to my watch right now. If I pick up my watch and I go turn the space shuttle lights on. My watch says, I can help you control your home when you use handoff for iPhone. <laughs> oh, so you have to hand it off. Womp, 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 yeah. Uh... So I'm kind of, I'm, I'm hoping that that's a temporary thing because really, I... Like, I, I want to be able to control my lights with my watch. Right. Come on. Doesn't seem I, like... There's an app. Yeah. There's an app for um, <laughs> for for my HomeKit setup. Uh, there's yeah. just not Siri integration. Just that. But overall, like, this, the fact that I can pick up my phone and be like, set the lights to 65 <laughs> is really cool. I agree. Uh, I agree. And I can't wait to try it out with the thermostat, too. Because I love the idea of, like, if I'm bundled up and shivering on my couch, I'm like, it's too cold. Siri set the thermostat to 72. Oh, laziness. <laughs> <laughs> but we should mention, this is not unique to Apple. This is Apple's first entry into this. But the, this kind it's of... True. Others have been able to do this. Uh, Dr. Yeah. Mom's telling me that her Amazon... Alexa, the Echo. The Alexa, yeah. Amazon Echo can talk to smart things. So you can do, you could, and actually that's even cooler because it's sitting right there and you could talk to it and it will do all that yeah. stuff. There's there's one downside that you and I might run into, Leo, and that's you you need uh, new hardware for the hub. So we like we have uh, Hue lights. Yeah. So we're probably going to have to replace that little white box because uh, Apple's requiring end-to-end -end encryption for all the communications uh -huh. to protect passwords and things like that. And most of these devices weren't built with a secure Bluetooth or secure Wi-Fi right. chips to begin with. So the new versions, like uh, there's an Ecobee 3, it's already on the market, but the one that's shipping in July is the same exact thing, but with those secure chips inside it. So if you want to use the functionality for HomeKit and Siri, you'll have to replace not everything, like not the lights and not speakers and not a lot of stuff, but the little hub or uh, whatever they call the box that goes with it, the hub or the bridge or, you know, that component. The little bitty hub. Yeah. 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 But at least it's at least it's hopefully just replacing the hub and not replacing every single Hue light or other no, no, small device. That, yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. That you've already bought into, like yeah, the I mean, Cassetta, can... all of those switches will work as long as you have the new the new uh, bridge. Yeah, I, I'm getting a lot of uh, be, 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 some some NDA or some agreement seems to have lapsed at a certain time because you, you can tell when there's one <laughs> time of day where I'm getting like 18 different press releases every half hour about HomeKit stuff. And almost all of them, when I, when I do follow ups, they're, t they're talking about the exact same things where you won't have to if you're an existing customer, you can either just get an upgrade patch. You can do a firmware upgrade to uh, to to the whatever links it together or we can sell you a very, very inexpensive new home link that will actually be better than what you have right now, uh, which is a great thing because you you just you're not going to buy get people to buy into a system if you're going to tell them that not only do you have to replace uh, a lot of the light bulbs and all the a lot of the appliances in your house, but you have to make a dis you have to make the VHS versus Beta versus LaserDisc versus Selectivision versus nine other options, and that's the one you're going to have to build base all your hardware on. One of the great things about all of these solutions cross platform is that. Buy whatever you want. You know, do a little, do a little bit of due diligence. But it's chances are extremely likely that whatever you buy will work with whatever it is that you have. Yeah. And it's it's good too because I know a lot of people were hesitant to put any home automation things in their house because they saw that as attack vectors for their home network that they were basically yeah. opening up things that could be used willy nilly. And because this is end to end encrypted and they're insisting on it at the hardware level, as we move forward, I'm sure it's going to be easier for everyone to use those chips. Then hopefully every standard will use them, and then we won't have anyone you know just for convenience sake putting a lot of holes on their network. Yeah, yeah. I think that's a good thing. Nobody right now there's there's few uh, Internet of Things attacks. There have been a few, uh, some mm -hmm. FOSS cams, for instance, turned out the password protection wasn't effective. So people's, ca you know, in-house cameras have been put online, things like that. But I anticipate this is going to be a popular attack vector, if only to harass people. I mean, so what if you can turn my thermostat up, except it's annoying, yeah. right? It's not the end of the world, but it, but so I think Apple's very smart to insist on it, even though it's a pain point initially. Well, yeah, also and I will say, go ahead. 
I, I was going to say this. It's it's unknown what it's, it's unknown at this time what the vectors are and what can be accomplished with them, uh, because number one, there are a lot of these portals that try to get like sort of peer. Uh, uh, peer privileges with other network devices. And so in theory, if someone wanted to be super, super clever and choose the weakest point on your network, your, th your thermostat as a point of entry, that's a problem. You may as well lock it down. The second thing is that, I mean, a lot of the, we, most of what we're looking at are things like thermostats, things like, uh, thing, uh, things like light bulbs, but you can do a lot of damage. If you suddenly tell some, if you know that the, the temperature at, the, at your t target's house is going to be uh, 18 degrees outside, if you take that thermostat and, and force it down to like 25 degrees or turn it off entirely, now you've got frozen pipes, now you've got all kinds of nasty stuff happening. So I don't well, think, if, 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 any, if anything else, it's a, it's a trust point for people. You're trying to get people to invite control of their homes to an entity that they don't perf they don't absolutely understand a light switch you turn it on you turn it off you understand it so to simply say that look we've protected this so that only uh, devices that you approve and apps you approve can possibly control anything inside your house that's going to be a necessary part of the marketing for this and not to be tinfoil hat dude but a lot of these sensors that are coming online with HomeKit are exactly that they're sensors and they keep track of how many yep. people are in which room and that's you know that might not be information that you want and they move passwords around between the devices for authentication purposes and that like one of the things that, that Serenity showed me that blew my mind is that you can add multiple Apple IDs to this stuff so you can have more than one person with authenticated you know lockdown encrypted control and I, I wouldn't want those passwords moving around in, in, in yeah. less than secure devices either on top so of like everything else also Go ahead. I'm sorry. Go, go ahead. Yeah, I had my turn. Go yeah, ahead. I was going to say, um, on top of everything else, uh, that keeps you from having to enter in manual passwords. Like nothing is more of a drag than mm. launching an app and being like, all right, I have to enter mm -hmm. in the eight digit code to turn on mm -hmm. my lights and then it stops being fun. Uh, so instead, if you just have it all tied into Apple IDs, it just means, okay, you know, this this phone and any phone using that Apple ID and any additional Apple IDs I authorize. So my boyfriend, you know, he can totally use my lights. But rando off the street, <laughs> that's not going to happen. Yeah. It's also, all I was going to say was that it's, it's also important to sometimes, t given the variety of manufacturers you have entering this space, there's extra peace of mind when you basically say that, mm -hmm. Security is not something I need to trust the manufacturers to do because it's built into a home kit. It's built into the system right. that that I've put together. I mean, just last week was it uh, a, a really a really important uh, Bitcoin app? I think for Android was it uh, <laughs> had a huge vulnerability, and part of the vulnerability was that uh, the company. Re re based a lot of the security on an absolutely secure random number generator that it had to contact on another server. They had misconfigured the communication between the app and the server. And so what it was getting back was not a true general, true mathematical uh, random number, but an error, co error code explaining why the number had failed. And so every single instance was <laughs> the using same the same error code. Error code. <laughs> <laughs> and so it's, it's like, and it's funny because I don't have any of my money in, Bit in a Bitcoin wallet, but that's the sort of thing you're talking about where you you, maybe this is somebody who has a a great business plan and they, they've gone on Alibaba and they can buy like a thousand of these light bulbs and they're going to hire somebody not and pay them not enough money to write the software for it and they just screwed it up. So <laughs> it's such a great selling point to be able to say that, look, we you cannot call this a home kit product unless it has this level of security that you don't have to do yourself because we don't trust you to do that. And it might annoy early adopters like me and Renee to have to buy new mm -hmm. hubs. This is a brand, really a brand new market, and so most people are starting out for the first time. So it makes good sense. In fact, it's ultimately going to be a differentiator for Apple if HomeKit is more secure and more. We were looking. Uh, we just installed the Ecobee three this weekend at Georgia's house because uh, I don't have central air. So she installed it, and then we found out that we have to upgrade it. But it turns out it's it's just a modular component. I think it's one hundred and thirty dollars for the new one. So you pull it out. And you put the new one in and you're good to go. And they were less concerned about the price than having to actually take the wiring out and rewire something again. Yeah. Because to them, the stress was the home. Yeah, exactly yeah. Doing yeah, the that work, makes not, sense. Not yeah. buying it. Yeah. Well, yeah. I feel bad for smart things, but <laughs> they are a sponsor. <laughs> but I am. I wouldn't be surprised. I mean, I would, I guess smart things is owned by Samsung. So it's not like they don't have the resources to see what Apple's doing and say, okay, I guess we'll do that too. And there's nothing wrong with end-to-end -end encryption. And I think that. it works multiple. I think it's like CarPlay and Android Auto where these devices can support multiple protocols and that yeah. will be good for everybody because you buy it and it doesn't care which one you have as long as you have right. one of it and one of them, you can choose which one you want to use right. with it. Well, and that raises an issue. Uh, so uh, if you're working with Z-Wave and Zigbee, as SmartThings does, 
and they're not encrypted, can, how does Apple enforce its, it just says you guys have to rewrite your tool? Well, it's hardware chips. So again, like you have to use specific have to hardware chips for Bluetooth LE and Wi-Fi. Yeah, so to use those chips with with so hopefully that will force them all to become hardware encrypted. That's my utopian dream, at least. We're gonna take a break. When we come back, well, let's finally get to WWDC. I imagine there'll be some home kit stuff to talk about there as well. Our show, uh, Renee Ritchie's here and uh, Serenity Caldwell, both from iMore.com. Andy Anako from the Chicago Sun Times. We're talking about Apple. I have some actual personal questions I want to ask you in a minute. <laughs> uh, Lisa's Apple Watch stopped pairing or would keep losing. And she says she's, she, did you call Apple? Is that what happened? She, she, she to reset my settings on my phone. Apple said reset the settings on the phone. And so I reset my settings Yeah, on and the that phone. fixed it. And now it's, it's now it's paired. And it was instantly okay. paired. So he we, said, if that doesn't work, wipe my phone. Yeah, we did that. We don't no, 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 wipe, my wipe phone. the phone and the and watch. I said I don't want to wipe my phone right away. Yeah, so we'll kidding. see. All right. But it's it's paired. She's got a 38, and apparently a number of people with 38s have had similar problems of the watch losing track of the phone. Mm. Mm. Yeah, so that's weird. Resetting the watch, resetting the phone. Resetting the phone. We've reset the watch, obviously, but resetting yeah. the phone. Yeah. You know, I actually had that happen to my watch. I think uh, after I went on an airplane and I toggled airplane mode a couple times uh, on and off. I actually wrote a, a how-to on it. Um, for me, what ha you just you turn the watch on and off, and you turn the phone yeah, on and off. So that. you reboot both of them. Yeah, yeah. we did that. <laughs> yeah, we did that. Yeah. Settings. What? Which phone settings? Just reset the phone settings so it wiped out all my wiping. Oh, connections. oh, reset the phone oh, settings. Oh, oh yeah, wiping them all that out. Works. That's a little more draconian than just rebooting. But uh, who cares? So it's if rebooting doesn't work, try that. Reestablishing. So yeah, you have uh, several levels of reset, uh, and what the so that was the least draconian level which is just reset your settings yes. cool which is no good to know if you're having trouble with you now i have another question <laughs> <laughs> i'm i think i'm gonna does anybody want to buy a, a slightly used mac pro <laughs> <laughs> did you watch the zion announcements leo <laughs> uh well my, here's my thing this thing has been nothing but trouble as you know i had to trade it out the the initial problem i had was with ram and usb i'm having usb problems again it's getting i'm getting that dread device drawing too much power so we're you know dumbing it down and i've reset the smc several times i've reset the pram several times the only thing that i after i that's plugged in at all now is a keyboard and it's still saying that so i know the keyboard's not drawing too much power on the usb port no. so i'm just thinking it'd be a good time to buy a 5k imac and maybe uh, maybe you'll have a nice looking doorstop <laughs> <laughs> especially, especially with those new Thunderbolt ports. So when are those? Th when are those Xeon? When are, are the Xeons coming to the Mac Pro? Yeah. Oh, great! I don't, you don't need Xeons. I don't need Xeons. A generation behind. Yeah, yeah you'll you'll be. No, fine. I think a 5K iMac. Can I? Dr I'm driving two 27-inch cinema displays. I could still do that, right? Yeah, sure. 4K displays are fine. No big deal. Those are 2K displays. Yeah, even better. Yeah, nothing. Well, they're a little better than that. They're the cinema displays. The 27 now, the, the 5K iMac is still running Haswell. They haven't done, as far as I can remember, they haven't oh. done a Broadwell update for that yet. It may not matter to you because Broadwell's big selling point is power efficiency. Yeah, yeah. This is a it's desktop computer. In. Yeah. So, yeah. So, you might not care, but for people who, who want the latest and greatest. I wonder how well. Have they broken out Mac Pro sales numbers at all? I think that thing has not. No, has, they don't break out any Mac. That thing has, cannot possibly be selling well. Well, it's designed for, for a Lindsay. very niche market. Yeah, you know, yeah. it's not that it, that is not a high like a normal yeah. consumer project. That the, is a yeah. custom custom machine. The dunderhead yeah. market is really kind of small. It's, it's a Ferrari, oh, Leo. <laughs> it's <laughs> it's it's interesting when you look at there's so little difference between an iMac, a Mac Mini, yeah. and a Mac. Oh, yeah. MacBook Pro right now, that you really it really becomes what shape will fit your lifestyle at this point. It's not about power and it's not about accessories. It really yeah. is about what shape will work for you. Thank God I bought this base model. I didn't I didn't put in a bunch of stuff in there. I did. Oh, never mind. I don't want to. And if you get really upset, you know, I bet I I bet because it's a cylinder. I bet you could build like a potato cannon <laughs> and just like shoot it, fire at, it at, at a brick wall. <laughs> I say wear it to get at least twelve, like 12 views on YouTube. <laughs> it's a beautiful thing. But I also remember I bought the cube too. That yeah. was a beautiful thing too. It's a collector's item, Leo. Yeah, I wish it's going to be like the cube. cube. Yeah, I wish I'd save the cube. I, I would like it now, and I'm going to save the uh, the Mac Pro. I'm not going. Uh, I'll just we'll just put it on a shelf somewhere. <sighs> Set decoration. It works. We and 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 really uh, after the Mac Pro came out, the new so-called Mac Pro came out. 
that's when we decided to go all Dell in our edit yeah. edit suites and uh, Premiere Adobe Premiere. That that was the end of that. So, at least I don't have seven Mac Pros. <laughs> it could <laughs> couldn't be worse. Gazelle.com does buy your old iPhone, your iPad, many tablets, including Samsung, Microsoft, and Google tablets. It's a great way to get rid of old gadgets and uh, get the new. There's always something new and exciting. And this is how you can kind of, you know, feed your habit. Bring it to Gazelle. Gazelle gives you top dollar. The price you get today is locked in for 30 days into July. So you have plenty of time to decide to see what's new, what's different. Buy the new device, transfer your data over, then send it to Gazelle. They'll pay the postage, turn it around fast. If you forget or can't wipe your data, because they do buy broken uh, devices sometimes, uh, broken iPhones and iPads, certainly. Um, they'll wipe the data for you. They Don't worry about that. They'll take care of you that way. They'll even upgrade the uh, offer, as they have to us now twice, um, saying, oh, no, this is this is worth more than uh, than we thought. It's in better shape or whatever. It has more RAM, whatever, uh, storage, whatever. So uh, that's great. I never heard of a company, you know, I mean, they're, they're, they're only obligated to pay what they say they pay. They give us, they give us a huge bump on a 4S, I think. We, I think they offered us 32 bucks, and they gave us like 100 bucks instead. I, these are good people, Gazelle. After your item uh, has been accepted and uh, checked out, they will send you cash via check, PayPal, uh, or an Amazon gift card. That's actually a good deal. They bump that by 5%. So if you buy a lot of stuff on Amazon, Gazelle's a great place. You can also buy on, uh, on a Gazelle. Did you know that? They keep the best stuff, and they resell it as certified pre-owned. Two conditions, certified like new. Nothing to say about that. It's, it's as good as new. Or certified good, which shows the devices in both cases work perfectly. But the certified good devices might show some gentle signs of wear. Uh, but you're going to save even more money. In every case, they've been put through a rigorous 30-point inspection to make sure they're fully functional. And you have a 30-day risk-free return policy. It's Gazelle, the place to sell and buy now. G-A-Z-E-L-L-E, gazelle.com. I like this Elgato. You know, I've always had a soft spot for Elgato. Because uh, they did the TV, the ITV. I really liked it. They have uh, the Elgato Eve. I also like the name. It sounds like a feminine hygiene product. But in fact, <laughs> it's a room weather door and window and energy sensor system. You can monitor outdoor or indoor air quality, temperature, and humidity. They actually have a volatile organic compound sensor. Yep. That's kind of cool. Mm. Weather uh, is outside temperature and air pressure, door and window. So the idea is I could, I could with impunity, buy any of these, uh, like the Ecobee that you just installed. Do you like that better than the Nest? Yeah, for, well, some people didn't like the way that Google handled the transition and, and linking it to drop, com, uh, drop cam IDs. And so there's some philosophical issues why some people switched. Right. I, I don't really care about the philosophy. For me, I like the fact that it has the remote sensors. So you put the Ecobee unit uh, uh. where your central thing is, but then depending on the size of your house and the way it's laid out, you put these little sensors in high traffic areas oh. and then it can adjust dynamically as you move through the house. Oh, we need that. it more efficient. And I, I got a chance to interview um, the gentleman from Ecobee at CES, and he told me that he was, I think I might have said the story before, he was out uh, traveling in Europe, and he started uh, to see people, the, the number of people in his house increase uh, in his living room, uh -oh. you know, 10 people, 20 people, party. so he called home, and he, he said, honey, are you having a party? No, dad. And he uh -huh. goes, well, there's, there's 25 people in the living room. He's like, ah, busted. <laughs> I love it. Yeah, so, I have that problem because uh, we turn the thermostats in the hall will turn up the heat, but it gets really hot in the bedroom. Yes, because the hall is 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 in, is so that would be really so I'd put an extra sensor in the bedroom and then it would know oh yeah we're overheating the bedroom now. Yeah, and that was one of the things that we heard the most about the Nest because Android Central, our, our sibling site, they did a whole week of Nest earlier yeah. on, and that was one of the things that we heard back is I want to be able to get up and move and change rooms without having to constantly readjust right. it, and that's Ecobee's big selling point because that sensor will will recognize you, it'll do all that for you, and they claim it's even more efficient because as you leave and maybe you forget to change things, it'll just know that you're no longer in that part of the house and, and shut things down. Yeah, that would be really great. Yeah, it's super easy install too. I mean, like we're we're borderline incompetent and we got it up in on an hour or so <laughs> that is borderline incompetent uh no i think i i would guess you guys know what you're doing i could There's be no wrong to suggest that leo <laughs> more or less <laughs> more or less sort of <laughs> all right i'm sorry i got distracted i'm just looking at these so the ecobee is 249 and then the sensors 
Uh, you get one, and the sensors are 79 yeah. for two more. I would do that. That's that actually... It supports up to like 30, which is a ridiculous wow. number for most houses. iHome, which has been around for a while doing stuff. They have a That I like. Plug. The iHome I like because there's a lot of devices that aren't HomeKit um, compatible right now, but you can still just plug them into the wall. So I'm, I'm going to plug the Hue lights into that for now, and I won't be able to control them, but I'll at least be able to say turn on, turn off. And that will, I won't have to go to the app all the time. I can use Siri for the base functionality. And if you have fans or any other product at all that's not HomeKit compliant, mm. just plug it in here and use yeah. Siri to do the on-off function. The plug becomes uh, HomeKit yeah. compliant. That's a good yeah. idea. And it so if you have a space station in your house, you can control it. I'm sorry, space <laughs> shuttle. That's no We should start Leo. taking bets very on important. who. who <laughs> go ahead, Andy. Who, who's going who's to get the honor of having the hardware that Apple demonstrates at, during the keynote next week? Uh, like, what, what, who, who has shipping hardware that's in, that's going to be inside the Apple store that Apple chooses to say, guess what? You got four minutes. Don't screw it up. Most of these are so pre-ordered, but the Caseta, the Lutron is, is available, as you know, because uh, Serenity got one. Um, the Insteon Hub is pre-order. Uh, pre-order also for the Elgato E. I think Eve. the Insteon Hub might be today, but you can only order it. You can't buy it in the store. Yeah. Starting in uh, July. Yeah, a lot of these are ordered today, but not available or order soon, but not available yet. So, it so looks my like big question is, did Apple put these out this week because it wants to clear the deck before WWDC uh, and we won't see anything HomeKit related at right. WWDC because there's so much other stuff to do? Well, there's an opportunity because uh, Google, of course, is well, in this space too. We thought maybe Google would announce something at Google I.O., but they did not. Well, Brillo, I guess, is the, the closest Yeah, but Brillo is not. Brillo That's, is it's early, long yeah. way it's, off. Yeah. Uh, all right, so what are we going to see at WWDC? Ooh. Andy? Tim Cook. Hope, Tim think, Cook. Yeah. <laughs> Tucked uh, hopefully, or untucked? Uh, <laughs> Tucked or no. <laughs> oh. Does Tim tuck? I think I he's think, an no, untucker. I think he's he tucks untucked. his he was un No, he was Tim untucked. doesn't tuck his shirts, but Jeff Williams, do I don't know. Yeah. I don't keep track of this. <laughs> but <laughs> but they'll all, I can tell you one leave. thing. They'll all be wearing an Apple Watch. <laughs> if Tim is untucked, there's no new hardware. Is that what it is? Ah. <laughs> Will there be new hardware? Uh, Apple TV. It would be really stupid, for instance, for me to buy an iMac now or any Apple no, product. Uh, the I'm, well, a lot of them have been refreshed. Like the, the MacBook Airs, the MacBook Pros have right. all been refreshed. Uh, whether ha I, I still haven't seen any signs of Intel having those Broadwell chipsets ready for the iMac. So I don't know. I mean, that the sad thing is with Macs, they really are on Intel's roadmap. Right. So when, whenever those chips are ready. But um, as you said, Broadwell isn't faster. It's just better energy usage. Oh, so they might just bump it with Haswell like, and get right. slightly better clock speeds. But it's, it's it, because Apple has a show, you should absolutely wait. But I don't think you'll you'll see anything crazy with the iMac at this point. Yeah. Uh, well, we, you said Apple TV. Yeah. Pretty sure we're going to see that. The I'm service sure. might be delayed. Uh, again, the Apple TV is, is under iTunes. It's not like the iPhone or the iPad. So it really is bound to the... The, the, the priorities of the iTunes organization. And it could be that they decide that the lack of content deals makes it not a compelling enough product to launch, which I think would be really sad because we waited so long to get just the hardware upgrade. And I'd be super happy with that upgrade. But I think even if you don't get the Apple streaming TV service and you just get the modern processor, uh, things like metal support, and you get the SDK, then that's that's a that's a huge win for that device. And I think Apple, they don't need it at this point because it's not, it's not a major part of their business. But I think uh, if everyone who does want an Apple TV, I think them getting back into that game in a serious way would be appreciated. Apple TV, if they announce a new one, will feature an app store. It should. I don't know if it'll be a game yeah. store or a full-on app store, but it should. It, I mean, there's every indication. They, as far as I know, they've had that for a long time and just have been sitting on it. And well, it for like instance, it's, it's I can't put Twit on an Apple TV. Now, as it stands, only Apple can put anything on an Apple TV. I'd have to make yeah. a deal yeah. it's with channel Twitter. partnerships. Right yeah, you now. can partner. Yeah, right. but you can't. Right. You can't just build an app and submit it to Apple and hope that it appears. But I would love that. To, if I now, could, whether yeah. they uh, offer I, channels, we'll have to see because it could just be like if it's just a game system, then you'd have to make a twit the video game. But if it is a full on SDK, <laughs> then that'll open the that'll open I the doors do for that. a lot more we stuff. Could, we could have that yeah. happen, like knock the head off knock the head off Leo or something. I think that you be have one popular. episode of the screensavers. <laughs> Um, all right. And then you said they don't, that, that, you know, we keep hearing they're going to work and trying to work to create some sort of streaming TV service on there. Uh, premature, obviously. Uh, it's so hard. Yeah. I mean, it's, 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 it's hard to call. I, um, I can, I suppose I can talk now that last year I had somebody high up in the TV industry who was, I mean, an executive at a network who was telling me about some stuff. 
uh, and it look it, it it was the the char the characterization of his remarks were not so much the details of this deal, but just how it's like it's 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 like Zeno's paradox, one of those things where the first step was to get half of the issue solved. The next step was to get the, another twenty five percent of it solved. The next step was to get another twelve percent of it solved, and then you're left with it, it, you're left with a number of issues that. Both companies are very, very stuck on, mm. and you need to have a shift in perspective before one of them decides to give ground. That, that, that was the nature of the conversation that I had with this guy, but that was a year ago. But that's not uh, dissimilar to the conversations I've been had over the past two and a half years uh, about bringing uh, more content to Apple TV. People that they, it's, it's like, it's like Manhattan real estate. I mean, you own this property. And you are not going to let – and you know there's a limited number of it. If people want property on this block, if people want CBS, you're not going to be able to go anyplace else to get CBS. So you're going to hold out to get the exactly what you want. And if you have another uh, – if, if Apple or any other aggregator wants to get access to that content and they have the, these ideas about what they want their service to be and the sort of uh, – they, they, uh, things like privacy and not uh, using this channel as a way of – the advertis advertisers being able to learn things about the viewing habits of its viewers. If you don't get that, you're not going to get that. Uh, it's it, there, There's so many different things that, that could scotch us at this point that I've given up on predicting or assuming that any deal is going to be announced at any time. Recode, uh, Don Chmielewski and uh, Peter Kafka writing in Recode say Apple subscription TV service won't be announced next week. Although they do quote Les Moonves, who was at the Code conference last week, saying... Uh, that he thought CBS, he's the head of CBS, he thought CBS would probably sign a deal with Apple to carry his network. We're very excited about it, he told Kara Swisher. So far, the main negotiating point, according to Moonves, money. Yeah. How much are you going to give me? Surprise, surprise. But there's also, I think, some fear that if you, uh, if you go over the top with a network that you could uh, alienate the cable networks, the cable companies, which are the MSOs, which are very important to television networks. You got to be careful yeah. there. Uh, so it may be, in fact, that it'll be like every other uh, system except HBO now, where you have to log in with your cable company subscription to demonstrate that you you should be getting CBS uh, anyway. Yeah. Apple apparently wants to do live TV. That's They're another super thing. They're patient too. I mean, they always, they, they've waited years. Uh, the Apple TV hasn't been updated since March of 2012, and they could have updated it every year the way they yeah. did the iPhone and yeah. iPad. And they just waited because they believe that. This is the problem that they want to solve. And uh, Steve Jobs said it very well at the All Things D conference many years ago that if you think dealing with carriers is hard, dealing with all the tiny little fiefdoms that are cable networks, not just in the U.S., but internationally, is an absolute nightmare. So the technology has never been an issue for them. It's the go-to-market strategy involving right. content that's always been the big hang-up. Yeah. Well, because it's, it's really very thorny because uh, networks don't necessarily own all the content that they broadcast. Mm -hmm. So maybe the deal that they have with a production unit or with another studio says that, no, you don't get to simply package us with streaming content because we have our own package that we want to sell elsewhere. Or you're going to have to negotiate, open up brand new negotiations with us this is why uh, on a lot of uh, if you go to uh, websites for networks some shows you can get on demand streaming some you can only get clip packages and that's that will identify to you the sort of deal that that production ha company has with that network so it's really difficult and it, it, it is too bad I mean yeah, I hope that Apple even if they don't get this service uh, ready for the next two months Apple TV is just looking so moribund. It's not. It's not just the idea that it has not been gotten a significant upgrade in a couple of years. It's. It's an unpleasant experience to use Apple TV compared with all these other uh, alternatives that are out there. I mean, Fire TV is at least as good as Apple TV minus the AirPlay. Uh, Google Television is also. They, it's. It's a product that that Google seems to be interested in growing and not. They're not interested in waiting for uh, for every piece to be uh, to to be complete. So even if all they did was that we're going to revamp the interface, we're going to make authentication a lot smoother. We're going to make sure that you almost never are confronted with a black screen and a spinning dial that says authenticating buffering, authenticating buffering. That's a that's a win for me, uh, and so I, I just hope that Apple. Sometimes you really do have to indicate that this is an important product, and Apple has not indicated that with Apple TV in quite some time. And to Andy's point, I mean, one of the problems with Netflix has been they haven't been able to get shows because of things like music rights, and they eventually right. have to take a long time and strip out all the music or even so change. So sad. Them. I think yeah. Dawson's Creek has a different theme song on Netflix yeah. than it did originally. The, the, so the famous example of, of that is the uh, rate. What is that? The uh, radio show, uh, WKRP, WKRP in Cincinnati, in Cincinnati yeah. where yeah. they had real music in it. And that's why you don't see it in reruns, because it's all real music and it's not licensed for replay. 
Yeah, yep. there's such so many laws. Well, it's also it's sad there's documentaries like uh, The Eyes on the Prize, the documentary of the civil rights movement can't be shown because the estate of Martin Luther King won't give them the rights to continue yep. to show that I have a dream speech and other things. Will uh, the new Apple TV be a home kit hub? That would be why it, you might announce that. It ought to be. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, if, it, if, I don't see why it shouldn't be. Uh, the, the real question is whether or not uh, you'll need to connect it directly to your Ethernet uh, oh, no, for we don't the want that. proper end-to-end. -end. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Because, I mean, you know, uh, for us, our, our router lives in the basement. Right. So trying to run an Apple TV, you know, a, a long cable up to your Apple TV might be a little, a little bit of a hassle there. But I don't know if the end-to-end -end encryption can be done over AirPlay or over just straight wireless oh. when you're making that initial connection. Renee, you might know oh. better than I yeah, I, as far that. as I, they did, it's been years, and as far as I know, they've experimented with different things. And for example, at one point, they were thinking about putting the entire router into the Apple TV for people who just wanted an all-in-one solution. And as far as I know, one of the bigger rumors was that it it was just going to be a way for you to control HomeKit when you weren't at home. So as long as they could have an Apple TV uh, there, they would be able to track, uh, you know, it's sort of like that we do with Back to My Mac, where they, they take a... a I forget the actual way that it works, but they keep track of your IP address and they, they substitute that for your Apple ID and then always put those two things together. So even if you're at the airport and think you forgot to turn off the lights, you can still connect via your device and you have a secure connection to your Apple TV, which is a trusted device on their network and you can handle things. Uh, yeah. I don't think they're going to let it do much beyond that. Like they won't let it be a substitute hub, but it, just that functionality, they should be able with those chips that do the encrypted Bluetooth LE and encrypted Wi-Fi, they should be able to have it as, as a happy network citizen, regardless of Ethernet. Yeah, there, there's so much potential in Apple TV. Mm -hmm. you, when you think about it as having a, uh, a small, tiny, hideable device that runs off of a mobile processor that generates very little heat and draws almost no power, has Wi-Fi and Bluetooth uh, each built into it, uh, can also uh, be, and, and is an, in a fixed location in a house, you're describing a computer that is, here is the one device that we can count on always being turned on and available to the internet for any sort of device that's outside of that network that wants to com communicate with lights, with heating, uh, with printers, with uh, any sort of device that's inside that house and also the ability to simply identify that okay well the closest eye beacon to the user right now is oh. the apple tv that we know is in the living room yeah. so we know that we, we know that where uh, this signed in uh, user is going to be so not, none of this is based on conversations i've had with people but it's just such an obvious thing that if even if they did nothing cosmetically to the user interface or the user experience just the ability of having this always on device always connected to the internet and the most wireless device they have tethered to a specific location, it's a long eight-page list of things you can do with that sort of capability. Just taking a step back, it's really interesting to see we've come so far. The way technology uh, gets better incrementally, you kind of sometimes don't notice it, but we're now talking about really finesses uh, of, of capabilities and amazing things like being in proximity to your Apple TV and then the eye beacon sees you. And these are these are really kind of amazing technologies that yes. they've crept up us on us it's Apple, the future Apple's, it's the future yeah. got I mean, here Apple's somehow tomorrow land the, yeah. the big the big win always of of investing in apple is that they make things that just take advantage of each other's presence uh i i uh, the the fact that the fact that you have an ipad in the same room as your phone and your iPad can simply glom on to your phone's uh, internet connection, not by walking over your phone and turning on a Wi-Fi hotspot, by simply, but by simply like it's an active Wi-Fi hotspot waiting to be turned on by this device. That's why you have a phone and a tablet and a, and a, and a notebook that's all created by the same company. So you, you extend that to the home and you think, ooh, nobody knows how to make everything work together as one, as aggressively and as safely and as reliably as Apple. Yeah, at the same time, I was playing with, I don't want to name it, possible sponsor, new uh, uh, kind of Netflix-style service, playing with the Apple app. And I noticed it had Chromecast capability. It didn't have AirPlay. Mm -hmm. It had Chromecast. And I wonder if that's, are, we, are you starting to see that trend where there's, I mean, uh, they've sold, what did they say? They sold 17 million Chromecast. What's the number? It was a large number of Chromecast. It's 1.7 million. Something. Yeah, that's which is still peanuts compared to Apple TV, interestingly yeah, enough. Yeah. Uh, but it's it, they're, they're having a really big success with it, considering yeah. that this is a thirty dollars device, uh, and they're making it really, really easy for any developer to say, "Oh, sure, what the hell? We'll, we'll include Chromecast support." And now it's hard for me. I would have to do an audit of all the stuff that I have on my phone, uh, my iPhone, and my iPad. 
uh, just to say nothing of the stuff I have on my Android phone. But it's hard to mention, it's hard to think of an app that makes sense to have Chromecast support at this point that does not have Chromecast support. Yeah. It is really, really cool to have a sling box connected to your cable box and just simply uh, the, the fact that I have this little $30 thing plugged into the, the my living room TV means that I can I don't have to do a cable run through two floors in order to get there because uh, sling, the Sling Player app on my iPad is going to be able to make that connection for me. It was one of the it's one, it's one of the things that I think gets overlooked a lot is that when you have an iOS device, you have an, a pretty amazing Google experience. Like Google makes almost all their apps. I think Keep is one of the big exceptions, but you know that's pretty much a web view now anyway. And Chromecast and all all of this is well supported. Nest, all of those kinds of technologies. You have uh, I think Paul Thoreau said it really well when he said you have amongst the best Microsoft uh, support on it. Amazon, you go down the line, and if you choose, if you really want to have you know Google ecosystem, it's not as good as having Android, but it lets you have the Apple parts that you want and the Google parts you want and the Amazon parts you want. Uh, and that's an advantage to a lot of consumers. So Chromecast 17 million, what, what, what are, uh, do we know what Apple TV sales uh, were? They had 10 million units sold in 2013. I don't think they said recently. They haven't said lately. No. But the, uh, yes. given the number uh, sold per year in the last six years, there are more, far more than 17 million out there. Yeah. Chromecast should ex be accelerating much faster, though, because of the size of the Android market and the low, yeah. the low cost of it and, and how small and portable it is. Yeah, uh, It's tough, though. It's, it's it, No matter how good certain uh, Android or Google products are, it's so hard to remind people that they that these are available to them. Remember that, that uh, Google Wallet existed for about a year, year and a half before Apple Pay. And even I had to be reminded that, oh, right. you have a Nexus 5. You have the ability to do contactless payments, Andy. You just is this is just an app that you just noticed, you wrote about, then you forgot about. If you actually spend five seconds to activate it, you too can have fun with your phone paying for things at McDonald's and Panera Bread. Well, it was frustrating so. at first because the carriers were blocking it. So if you had a Verizon phone, you couldn't use it because Verizon right. had their own ISIS system now called SoftCard. But that's all kind of gone right. by the wayside. So Wallet has yeah. come into its own. And now Wallet's not going to be Wallet anymore. It's not going to be touch to pay. It's going to be peer-to-peer uh, uh, -peer, uh, Android payments. Pay. Yeah. Android pay, Android yes. pay is the new thing. Yeah. Right. I think that folds in the technology that they bought that was being used by a lot of carriers anyway, which is yes. nice. Yes, yeah, they bought, yeah, they bought it. So I think they bought SoftCard, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah SoftCard, that's it. Yeah. Uh, all right, we're going to talk about the music subscription service because that's really going to be, I would bet that's going to be the biggest uh, store. Maybe, well, I don't know. What's the biggest story uh, going to be on Monday at WWC? It's going to be the music, right? Because you're going to have... You you're going to want to be there because there's going to be like yeah. the Foo Fighters will be there or somebody. Because right? Drake will be DJing. Yeah. Drake well, will no, be DJing. You know what? I, I actually think the biggest the biggest thing we'll see are new versions of iOS and OS X. Those oh. are, those are going to be the flagships without That's question. That's because you're geeks. That's because you're well, geeks. Well, no, no, no. <laughs> that I mean, we're nobody gets about excited about that. Conference. Come on. We're talking about yep. a developer oh, okay. conference. We're talking yeah. about the things that developers are going to be excited about. As a consumer, sure, I can be like, ooh, a new music service. But the things that are going to actually fundamentally change how we use our devices, yeah. um, the security improvements that are going forward in OS X, is that is that something that's going to be like, ooh, so shiny? No, not so much. <laughs> but I think those are going to be like the big important things. Yeah. Yeah. But in terms, like if we want to talk just straight consumer shiny, it's probably going to be a... a divide between the new music service and the Apple TV. I still don't think that they're going to, they're not going to put on a show the way that I think they do with say the iPhone or the Apple watch events. They're going to be more, more thinking about positioning it as a developer device, as well as like, this is really cool, but I don't, I don't think we will get Drake DJing on stage. Like I, yeah, I, I, I kind of feel like that's maybe maybe at the bash on Thursday, maybe we'll have Jimmy Iovine and all his all his buddies at <laughs> at the WWDC bash being like, no, let's celebrate our new music on. service. You don't think but, Dre and Iovine will be on stage on Monday? Oh, I'll they might. No, no, they might. I'm just saying we won't have yeah. a. I don't think we'll have a musical performance. performance. Yeah. Oh, I yeah. bet we will. Well, look if look because it, it well you know what let's take a break and we'll debate it. How about that? Music next the the new Apple streaming music service, but first snacks. Because I know you spent all morning, Serenity, doing the home kit thing, and you're eating some cold fridge lunch. <laughs> That's not good. We need to feed not you. Not as good as snacks. We gotta get give you some nice. Everybody loves snacks, but wouldn't it be nice if snacks were as healthy as your meal? Nature Box makes healthy snacks you will love, like mini Belgian waffles. What? Oh my yeah. God. <laughs> what? <laughs> you know, you go to snack. So why don't you eat something tasty, satisfying that doesn't make you feel terrible? afterwards 
Over 100 healthy, crave-worthy options, all nutritionist-approved, never any artificial flavors, colors, or sweeteners, zero grams of trans fat, no high fructose corn syrup, just delicious stuff like this, honeycomb sunflower kernels. We know sunflower seeds are full of great stuff for you. Give them a little boost with some honeycomb flair, flavor. And, they're, you know, it's simple. If you look at the ingredient list, it's always short and sweet. It's just what you expect. Oh, I, I hear somebody snacking already. These yep. are <laughs> Andy's eating. What are you eating there? Uh, the probiotic fruit and nut mix. Those I are know good. That That's just... good. Bl blueberry Greek yogurt pretzels. These are really good. Sarah Lane stole all of them. We had to get a whole new shipment in. Uh, white, <laughs> white truffle popcorn, coffee kettle popcorn. This is these are just five snacks. There are many more awaiting for you at NatureBox.com, like strawberry lemonade fruit stars or sweet and salty nut medley. Now, here's what I want you to do. Get the free sampler first so you know what you're getting into. A trial of your favorite snacks delivered right to your door. Just pay $2 for shipping at naturebox.com slash twit. And we thank them so much for their support of MacBreak Weekly, not just of the show, but also they feed our staff. We get, I don't know, we have like eight Nature Boxes a month or something coming. We have a huge number. <laughs> Very tempted. All right, music. We know a lot, I think. Or, or is, I mean, it is all just rumor. Apple's not said anything. Uh, this dates back to the acquisition for three plus billion dollars of the Beats service, the Beats company. They got the headphones. They've already started selling those. They've even updated them. They've got new wireless headphones and so forth. So they're still in the in the headphone business. Uh, but most people agree the real gem in the crown of Beats was their streaming music service. Not because it had so many subscribers, not, you know, just a hundred thousand or so. But because Apple needed, after many years of turning its back on streaming music, to do something. What will they do on Monday? Serenity, you got thoughts on that? I go back and forth on how detailed the service will be on Monday. Obviously, they've spent a long time getting deals together. Beats has their own group of uh, artists that they've worked with. iTunes Radio has their group. Um, I think what we'll see primarily is we'll hear a lot about the new music app, uh, which is in beta right now uh, for iOS developers. We will probably hear about the new unified service, what it's going to look like, uh, what its name is going to be. Is iTunes radio going the way of the dodo? Is Beats Music dead to the water? I, I kind of feel like the Beats Music brand might stick around for headphones, but I don't know if it will continue to be the overwhelming name for the subscription service. And then we'll find out what pricing looks like, uh, whether we're going to look at more like the Beats Music service pricing, whether they're going to lower the Beats the, the service pricing to, a, to an even lower buy-in, whether or not they're going to have a free tier that's been talked about a lot. Uh, in, in general, it really comes down to look, pricing, and name. And uh, they'll probably have some some big headlining thing, uh, music wise. And we we've got you know Beyonce exclusive to our platform or something like that to really to really sell it to the music nerds. I'd be surprised audience. since Jay Z owns a competing service, but <laughs> it could happen. It, it's business, they own. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm sorry. I mean, I couldn't resist the blueberry <laughs> Greek yogurt pretzels. It caught me. Yeah. Um, so good. <laughs> it's complicated. I mean, there's uh, the every, everybody in business who talks about this talks about how uh, you can see that you can see that more people are if if they got X dollars to spend per year on music, they're spending more of it on on subscription services and less of it on uh, on actually purchasing music. So um, it's certainly in everybody's excuse me. It's, at, it's certainly in Apple's best interest to simply to simply decide that they need to switch. That they need to switch from an iPod idea to an iPhone idea before they can no longer sell iPods, so to speak. Uh, so they want to get this done sooner rather than later. The, but the question is, people have a lot of habits, and so it's going to be a fight between people whose habit is to use a service like Spotify versus buy music. And then so once you get someone to, uh, to, to make that switch, 
are you going to switch anybody who is using Spotify? They again, they're they're not brand new here. They've not just started using streaming music services, so they probably have Spotify. They have all their playlists set up there. How easy is it? How attractive is it going to be to switch to an Apple service? Uh, and how easy is Apple going to make it for, to switch from Spotify to this new service? So there, there are just so many variables here that uh, I, I can't even predict success. Uh, or failure. All I got to do is hope that they do at least something to improve the music app, which is one of the real weak points of uh, of iOS. You mean, at this you point. mean iTunes? I mean, yeah. No, no, the music app on iOS and the, and, and and iTunes as well. I mean, yeah. this is this is there are a few apps that I really believe really need to be destroyed and then replaced with something brand new. And I think that music is it. It's just it, it is such a lash up of. Uh, of all the years it's uh, it's been available and all the years, all, all the changes in how people acquire and consume music that I don't think it serves anybody particularly well. It's frustrating as hell for me to just figure out what is on my device right now, what is not on my device right now. If I'm if 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 I want to listen to this uh, to to this album right now, what is going to cost me in terms of Wi-Fi or, or or broadband connected connectivity versus what is already on my phone? And the fact that it's that it's that hard to get even that done. So the, the fact that it's so hard to do even searches just tells me that uh, I'm. I hope that they, if they start a brand new streaming service, I hope it works well for them. But I just want a music player that works better than the one I have right now. Well, they, I, iOS 8.4 has the all new music app already. Like it's yep. it's, un, it's in beta. Um, I'm not enough of a music aficionado. I, I barely ever open that app. It's my secret shame. I don't listen to a lot of <laughs> uh, music on my phone. But uh, it is all new and all different. And, yeah, I guess people well, have opinions on that. Even but if you are an aficionado, it, the chances are the aficionados are opening Spotify. Or or something else, RDO. Well, that's I think that I think that's like, the real risk we, for Apple is they're going to lose the business entirely. I think that's absolutely true. But if we there's a lot we don't know about what they're doing, but we can see what they have done, and that is they were going to launch iTunes Radio, and it went out in the U.S. and it went out in Australia, and then it stopped. And they bought Beats, and people were still wondering what was happening with iTunes Radio. Well, after they bought Beats, all of that went away, and they started making a bunch of new plans. And uh, there were some ups and downs with the development of what those new plans were going to be. But the key things for Apple was the human curation that they thought that Beats did really well. They thought that was an advantage, that they had sort of these people behind it. And a lot of people did like the results of whether it was absolute human curation or some blend of it. They did like the results. And rolling that across the entire catalog when they start hiring, and there's rumors, I think, just earlier this week about Drake and, and Farrell and, uh, and Dre and, and how the service might be a lot more, like it might actually have uh, a DJ factor to it. That That's sort of how they want to compete. I, I guess they feel like um, they were at iTunes. A lot of the world is now in Spotify or something else, and they want to offer what they think will be a an interesting service for where people go to next. That's what Jimmy Iovine said from day one with Beats before it was an yeah. Apple product was, we're going to bring back curation. We're going to bring back real people uh, telling you what to listen to. And it's, uh, you know, okay, but it didn't exactly make Beats a world beater. I think it might be a little too late. Well, it was U.S. only. It was mostly, I think, it tied to AT&T at the right. beginning and and getting scale at those kind of services. I, I remember the early days of Spotify. I think it started, I might be remembering wrong, but I think it was one of the ones that started in Europe and people were waiting for it to move. And, yes, and yeah, they Apple's first than Europe, yeah. Yeah, Apple's ability, a, 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 the thing that Apple can do for Beats, because Beats can do curation for Apple and it brings Jimmy Iovine in and that helps relieve Eddie, Eddie Q's monstrous job, which is already huge enough, but it is to help them scale. Like they can get the Beats headphones into all the stores, but they can also get uh, whatever this new service is called into that music app on uh, hundreds of, of millions of iOS devices. And that Apple's advantage is when they hit that update button, uh, it, it took a little while to get to 80%, but it took almost no time at all to get to 60, 70% adoption for iOS 8 and iOS 9, at the very least, people will see it and maybe press it. And that's an advantage that they're going to have over a lot of their competitors. There's curation yeah. and other things too. In fact, Andy, I remember, boy, that was a great thing you did. And I recently re-upped for Spotify. I had let it lapse because I was using uh, Google Music. But uh, when Spotify started carrying our podcasts, uh, I re-upped and I, my, 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 all my playlists were still there, including that great one you did where you invited, and this is what's, this is where Spotify really shines. You invited people to add to a public Spotify playlist the one song. The song, if you had only one song to pick, that you would pick as as the song. And I love that playlist. It's And it's it's still there. Yeah. It still works. It's great. That's curation. In my mind, that's the best. Yeah. it's Again, there's so many variables here. I, 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 curation is a really great thing. But it, honest to God, uh, 
I don't care about the credentials of the person that they picked to cur curate a, a certain playlist. Random person on the internet that simply has good taste, uh, pick songs that I like and has is a lot more adventurous than I am. Don't care if they never work for the BBC. Don't care if they're making eighteen thousand dollars a year. They, they're 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 the person that I'm picking to curate, and anybody can do that. So I just don't know what they. I, 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 what, there, there are times when you say you just don't know, and you mean that sort of as a backhanded. Well, this is this is a stupid idea. I'm saying I literally don't know what Apple would have to put into a streaming service to make it into a successful thing. Although, as Renee says. Just the simple fact of, uh, of an app that comes preloaded on every single phone that ships is a huge, huge yeah. advantage for whatever service that Apple chooses to ship. I see. Yeah, and I know that we don't uh... care. Go ahead, Renee. Go ahead, Renee. Sorry, I was going to say, oh, I was I was say quickly that. <laughs> Renee! I, I'm just going to say quickly that it, it doesn't really, like, I, I'm the same as Andy. Like, I wouldn't know who was curating it, but I don't I don't see the appeal of Beats headphones and the loud bass, and obviously right, those are right, hugely right, right. popular. So I, maybe the millennials or whatever the proper term is for the Generation X really do care that it's Drake or Farrell or Dr. Dre, and that along with it being on their phone is going to make it an attractive service to them because, you know, if it, it, we you never know what's going to be the next big hit thing. You can only hope that you have enough ingredients, and it seems like at least that's the way that they're going with it. Superstars. Go ahead. It's all about the superstars. Oh, I honestly, I was just going to make a joke about, you know, not front loading <laughs> it with you too. But uh, no, <laughs> that would be nice. Yeah. No, I like yeah. it. I know. I, I love you too. I, I was. I think the, the playlists I, I like and I'm interested in, you know, when Rolling Stones is the 500 greatest rock and roll songs of all time, that's a list I would load. And uh, um, KCRW has a summer playlist that's updated regularly. And that's in Spotify, by the way. That's a list I would load. So there are some lists I load. Because it's often the case that you kind of want to listen to music without picking it, but you don't want necessarily a Pandora-style radio station. So playlists work quite well uh, there. And so the, it, I thought it was very interesting the way Beats did the curation. You, you build a sentence. I think it'll be interesting to have superstar people. As you say, Renee, everybody's going to have it, and they're going to have it presumably free for a month, although I, you know, Apple would be smart to make it free for the first three months or something like that. Yeah, give them some give them some time and also yeah. integrating it integrating it both with uh with Siri with the phone um with CarPlay will be huge. I know one of my frustrations right now with Beats um and with RDO and a, a couple of the other streaming services that I try is that when I'm commuting, when I'm driving up and down New England, um it's very hard for me like if I want to switch a playlist in the middle of in the middle of driving and I'm on Beats I have to pull over to the side of the road and pick up my phone and like select things because there's no way to say, hey, switch the switch to this yeah. Beats playlist or switch my sentence. That's because you're using uh, an iPhone. I hate to tell you. <laughs> on Android. Put it you on can, your watch. You'll get arrested. Yeah. On Android, arrested, you, you, you can just say to your phone, I want to listen to the Rolling Stones and it'll play it. Oh, yeah. Well, well sure. I could, I could do that on iTunes radio. I just really don't like iTunes radio yeah. well, right now. You get to choose on Android what uh, is the default uh, music uh, system, so you could make yeah. it be Spotify or whatever. But that, mm -hmm. that 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 is an insight into what could be really awesome if it if it hooked it into Siri in a very natural way with a lot of I deep agree. learning. I agree. The ability to say I want to hear a lot of rock from the past three or four years that is different from anything that I've been listening to for the past five months, which is a really complex thing. But it but it shows you the sort of thing I'm talking about. I mean, that's the sort of thing that natural language can do. And that a subscription service can do that my own collection can't. Um, I do have, uh, I think like most people, I have some curated playlists that I, I have a lot of fun managing and moving songs in and out of. But really, that doesn't help me discover new music. And it doesn't help me help to, help to surprise me with stuff. And it's not always tailored to every single thing. So uh, if, if, if that could be integrated with Siri, uh, not only would it be a great feature, but it would also be a way that Apple could sort of hit a feature uh, over the heads of every other streaming service because nobody is going to have this level of integration with Siri uh, as Apple will. That's true. And to Andy's point, I, what I would really like is we saw a lot of continuity last year, but we didn't see any for media. And I, I would just love to walk away from my Mac and the playlist to just automatically go to my iPhone or my Apple Watch or walk yeah. away from my Apple TV and the movie just does seamlessly switch to my iPad. There's so many interesting things you can do once you're broadcasting activity and once you can move that activity. And it's going to be complicated. I noticed uh, there's handoff on the watch now. So Henry was showing it before. And I'm typing a message on my watch and I decide I'm a little frustrated because I want to say something else. I can just pick up my iPhone and swipe up. 
But then I have Safari on my Mac and it's not quite sure whether I want to hand off Safari or hand off messages. But I think that whole area, once it gets really good at that and I can move video and audio and all those kinds of things as well, then that that convenience of having that whole ecosystem again becomes powerful. Yeah. But that, that brings up another point, and uh, uh, and if, if I'm changing the subject, we can bring, we can come back to it. Change later. away. Uh, I have no. Okay. Well, I'm just I'm just saying that uh, a lot of the stuff we've been talking about, a lot of stuff we've been reading for, with other people uh, about, is that it's not so much going to be here's this brand new shiny thing uh, that we're releasing in iOS nine, but we are basically trying to make all the features that we've been rolling in there for the past year or so work better. Uh, and Renee, I mean, you you, you bring up something that uh, was just so frustrating this morning, where uh, I was having breakfast with a friend of mine. And I ran into construction, so I had a detour around it. So I was very late. I knew my friend was at the restaurant with his iPhone next to him. And so when we were at a, when we were at a red light, I just raised up my my Apple Watch and said, "Text so uh, message so and so. I'm running a little bit late. If you order this for me, I'll probably be there in 12 minutes." Uh, and then he never got it. And the reason why was because he was lo uh, the, the the reason why was because he uh, he was logged into messages in his house, but not logged into <laughs> messages on his phone. And whereas I assumed that because I was sending him a text message from my watch connected to my phone, it would send it as an SMS. It said, "No, I'm just going to send this to his computer in his office, oh, not dear. on his phone." And that's the sort of thing that makes you re <laughs> makes you wonder. I hope Apple doesn't make a car because that would be a very surprising first month of driving if if, if oh, that sort of logic winter tires is, is, on this isn't car. here. Yes. It's like, I, I I found a better route for you. It involves cutting through this backyard. You're welcome. So so if, if, Apple, if really Apple, if all Apple does is really make the point that here is how we're trying to make your overall experience better, that would be the best win for me. I don't I, I don't care about this the new G Wizzy uh, features that they, they want to put in. I just want fewer moments like that. And it, incidentally, the way to fix that was to go into my phone settings and basically say that, look, forget I met forget I message for text messages, always send them as SMS, uh, which would solve the problem for me. And there's other things I could do. I had to change a bunch of settings to make sure that wouldn't happen again. But the fact that that would get through and be a problem is just surprising to me. Yeah. People are asking for a link to your uh, Spotify <laughs> one song playlist. We could start over again, right? We could actually, people could start adding to it again. There's a 170 some songs on there already. I could, I could, I could tweet that out tomorrow. Okay. It's a, it's, it's a really, it's something, I, it's something that uh, as a matter of fact, is uh, Tonya angst, uh, actually introduced that to me uh, because oh, uh, there what was a, a small world that's nice be because she she was having a, a birthday party for uh, for Adam and decided as a gift she she decided to ask all of her all of his friends who recommend one song and one song oh, only to add neat. to a playlist and after I, I realized that wow that's a fun challenge because if I'm only going to recommend one song it doesn't even necessarily have to be the best song but here is one song you really like that you want someone else to know about. No, it again. No blog post behind it. No, you mm -hmm. have to listen to the album first. I'm saying you just get to tell me a title and nothing else. It's an interesting challenge, and you wind up with a really interesting playlist. Well, did you have to manually add the songs, or could people uh, go to Spotify and add that? No, I was. I was. Matter of fact, I did it on Twitter, and every time I saw a song that was, uh, and, and, uh, uh, and people were doing it with replies, and then someone actually created that that Spotify playlist for me before ah, I got around to doing Fido it. Fido did. Okay. Uh, I, I was I was going to I was going to sort of curate a little bit more but as soon as like it was halfway done and this uh, playlist appeared I realized that wow this is much much better than having someone offer an opinion on these picks. So let's just, you know, have it uh, have it come on. It's kind of crazy because uh, it's all over, you know. It's Bruce Springsteen to Johnny Depp. Somebody but that's, but that's exactly <laughs> that's exactly what you want. It's yeah, like, it's you. You want that random seed mm -hmm. it's inside your inside your playlist. It's like you don't and you you, you want to you want to make sure this is not based on any sense of logic. It's not trying to profile you or guess what you want. Right. It's just simply saying at, at some point you just have to throw the dart at the world at, atlas and learn about something that you had never even considered looking at before. You can see I've subscribed, uh, and this was back way back when I was a Spotify user. I subscribed to a lot of playlists. Uh, there's Biblify.com had a variety of playlists, KCRW I mentioned. So um, there, there are people who, I guess, I presume to this day, continue to publish cur like curated playlists. So in a way, the, this kind of curation exists. It's not as you know cool as making a sentence or Jimmy Iovine's top five, but uh, I think this is one of the reasons Spotify has done so well. And it is sticky, uh, especially yeah. once you start adding these playlists to your collection. You can't you can't get that into another service. 
Yeah, you know, it's and again, it's hard to imagine what kind of value gets what what kind of value that any service could act by saying, "Look at this incredibly talented playlist curator that we hired." It's right. not going to be the credentials. It's going to be look, show me one of your playlists. Wow, that's awesome! Great. Okay, right. I'm I'm in. Yeah, I mean, I don't know who Kieran Donahue is, but he created a list called the 500 Greatest Songs of All Time, mm. and uh, you know what? I it's it's a good list. I mean, okay, it may, not, good, it, may not be your list, list but, but that's good. <laughs> But, th but that means that that at least 130 of them are going to be songs you've heard so a million often times. that you're kind of, <laughs> yeah. yeah. I like your I mean, one song list. Exactly. It's my favorite playlist. Yeah. Cedric Ingram did a Guitar Heroes uh, playlist. You know, what's interesting is when this when he first created this playlist, more than half of the 41 songs were not available from Spotify. As oh. of today, almost all of them are. Yeah. So I find that kind of interesting, right? Uh the, the 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 playlists have really expanded what you can uh, what you can get. No, I love that. And yeah. you know what? There is um Beats has a, a playlist section where it's not just, you know, make the random sentence, but there are folks working behind the scenes building uh these really, really great playlists. There's uh there's one one woman in particular, uh Susie Cole, does amazing classic rock playlists mm -hmm. that I got completely addicted to, to the point where I was just downloading all like anytime she would do a new playlist, I'm like, oh yeah, I'll listen to it, even if it's not classic rock, because I know that your taste in music is good. And it's I, the new and form of DJ, right? Yeah, uh, it's, it's great. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, I you know, it, there's nothing wrong with competition. Uh, I, I hope Apple does a, knocks it out of the park. I'd love to see a great service. We know they're going to charge 10 bucks, right? It's going to be the same as everybody else. The music industry would have to give them a break to change that, right? I don't know. I mean, I mean we've heard rumors for seven ninety nine. dollars Yeah. Uh, but that may just be Apple taking a cut to try and boost adoption. Right. The other thing Apple could do, as Amazon and Google have done, is integrate your existing collection, your iTunes collection, into uh, any streaming service. I, I'm sure they will do that. And that's an advantage Apple does have over Spotify. They have iTunes match already. Just sitting yeah. waiting. Yeah. So that would be pretty cool. What will we hear about OS 10 and iOS? You said that was the most exciting thing, Serenity. What yeah. are you excited well, I, about? I think it's, I think it's the most exciting uh, yeah. in part because I like new software. Um, I like being able to do new things with my already very powerful iOS and Mac uh, devices. On the Mac side, the big the big rumored uh, improvement is this new security system called Rootless, which I'll let Renee talk a little bit more about since he's more up uh, up to date on it than I am. Um, on the iOS side, we're looking to see a bunch of sort of improvements across the board, but one of the biggest rumored ones, at least according to Mark, I have all of the sources, German from nine to five, uh, is a new version of Siri integrated with Spotlight and a couple other services uh, codenamed currently Proactive. Now, I don't know if this will actually appear in the next version of iOS in its final form, but anything that allows Siri to do more things, I am on board with. That makes me happy. That makes me excited. Um, and we've also heard that uh, that we might see some more stuff with the map with maps. We might actually finally see transit data. Fingers crossed. <laughs> um, although it's you know I I am still on the Google Maps train. I love many many things about Apple Maps, but its directions and traffic are not are still not my favorite. And it's not that they're bad. It's just that Google has the slight edge, I think, in track. I mean, they, they've been doing this longer. They they have the head start. And I don't think that Apple necessarily still has the resources to to catch up to them. So I'm I'm hoping I'm hoping I'm wrong. I'm hoping we'll see some more maps improvements that will make me a happier person. <laughs> I love all these code names at Apple so much, but proactive just sounds high fiber to me. Yeah. Not my favorite. I think yeah, the, the rootless stuff is super interesting. The security stuff in general is super interesting, and it's 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 this huge focus because it's you know Apple.com slash privacy, so it's right at the top. And I think the idea is that you you can run. One of the big problems now is that people still run as administrator on Mac. There was this this, this idea that Macs were infallible for a very long time, but you, you, there are exploits in browsers. There are forms of malware. There's phishing. There's social engineering. There's all sorts of ways you can attack uh, an operating system. The issue is and really more, uh, escalation, right? That uh, you yeah. could escalate your privileges the bad guy could 
Uh, so case in point, the, UF, the UEFI uh, vulnerability that was reported on this weekend is an escalation. Once what, They need to actually have something on your computer. They have to be able to have root access on your computer. Right. But once they do, they can take persistent control of that computer using a flaw in the in the way that it resumes from sleep. Uh, this is only for 2014, mid-2014 and previous Macs. But it's still a problem. And if you run as a standard user, it's not a problem. But most people don't run as a standard user. They run as an administrator. So the idea is the user shouldn't have to care. They shouldn't have to worry about who they're running at. It shouldn't, they shouldn't have to go into settings and change their account and make all this. They should just not have access to the things that can do them problems right. unless and until they decide to go and escalate those things. This is so, the equivalent I, of hiding the library folder, right? Yes. <laughs> so that happened last time, last uh, a big uh, upgrade, you, the, or maybe even a couple more ago. You, don't, you didn't see your library folder unless you knew enough to hold the option key. Will it be that simple of a speed bump or is it going to be a lot harder to get administrative privileges or root I mean, there's privileges. a couple, like, like there's the extreme example, which is on iOS, you have no file system access because they believe it's, it's intrinsically not a human way of organizing things. But you've had technologies like this, like the Mac App Store stop, stops you in large part going to websites and downloading things. And we've seen the horrible crapware that a lot of download websites attach to their download. So it prevents all that. Uh, things like Gatekeeper um, will stop you from downloading apps and you can choose Mac App Store only, uh, trusted developers, or, you know, if you want to, anything and everything. But you have to opt out of that stuff. So I think it'll be similar to that. And uh, sandboxing is another great example. And I think that's the same team who's, who's working on this, uh, is that it'll just, it'll work. And most people will just never know that it's even there. And if you try to do something that requires a level of root access, you might have to authenticate or do something but else. They already do that, don't it. they? I mean, when I'm, even if, if I'm running as administrator, I will have to give my password to install a program, to modify system files or system folders. That already exists. This is must be more than that. Well, I think it seals off more because you can, uh, the exploit here was just, uh, the, the fear was that someone could force you into a sleep cycle or something. So it can, sometimes uh. it's not a major command. It's an, inno it's an otherwise innocuous command that something malicious piggybacks onto. Uh, and most people probably don't have to open up the terminal and don't have to access any of those. See, functions. I do that all the time though. I like to be able to do that. And I presume there'll be some mechanism for me to be able to have full access. I don't know hardware. the details, but I assume, but I, I, just from the name itself, it sounds like it's basically you get, you run as administrator without root access. Right. Uh, which yeah. is a huge boon. And there's a bunch of other security stuff that they've been working on for a while in ways to, you know, improve. Um, if you want to just hand your phone to somebody, you don't want them to have access to everything. Right. Uh, and when I look at the state of security, it, it's it's so open right now. For example, uh, and I've used this example before, my friend Phil Nickinson, he had uh, a Motorola device that was a, it was a trusted Bluetooth object. And as long as he was wearing that, it could unlock his phone. But if I just, if, if he left it on the table, I could just pick it up and unlock his phone. It didn't know me from him. But now you have something like the Apple Watch, which, you you have to authenticate with, but then you have skin contact too. So it kind of knows that you're the one wearing it and then you can start unlocking things. So you have these trust relationships with things like Touch ID and things like the Apple Watch that then you can start doing or, or using to extend your security, to project security the way we're projecting extensions onto other surfaces. And I think just the, the whole thing is security in general. If they could make it easier, but also safer, uh, the way Touch ID did, the way the the, um, the skin contact sensors do, do, I think those are the big wins for just mainstream people everywhere. As long as they don't make it impossible for people who like to use the command line. And I see the reason I still use Macintosh is because I consider it a, a BSD system and I want to be able to hit the command line and do stuff. As Unix Absolutely. Posix, Leo. No, might, and I don't think they'll ever take that away. They better I think not. It'll just be, <laughs> no, it'll, it, yeah. it'll just be available for the power users who want it. Right. Rather than more overtly available yeah. for your average, you know, something, mother or father. Something akin to holding the, the secret hold down the option key to get the light. Yeah. Well, you do that now, right? For like you, if yeah, you don't, don't know any that. better, you try to launch an app that, that you don't know where it came right. from. And it'll say this came from the internet. You can't launch that's it. That's a great thing. But if thing. you know, you can press, you can right click right. or you can press alt and launch it. Yeah, that's a great thing. And that's the right. Th oh, you can hold on alt key and do that. Oh, okay. Good to know. Yeah. We should, we'll do it. We'll digress a little bit and get back to uh, what's going to be an, New in iOS and uh, OS 10 at uh, WWDC. But briefly, since you mentioned it, let's talk about this UF, UEFI exploit. Uh, Pedro Vilaca, who is a, a OS 10 a security guy, says, Max shipped prior to mid-2014, so that's the vast majority of Macintoshes, are vulnerable to uh, essentially an exploit that would give be, be own, own them. Yeah. Uh, this and the, this kind of a sneaky way to do it. You have to do it after sleep. <laughs> the, the Mac wakes up from sleep, and uh, then you can reflash the Mac's BIOS 
using uh, the user land function uh, to contain a, a root kit or whatever the hell you want to put in there. And it does not, and this is really important, require physical access to the machine. It requires root access, but not physical access. So if you don't have physical access, you have to have used a, a different kind of exploit to gain remote access previously. First do that, and then you can do this. So it yeah. is still, it's still not going to be uh, something that's going to happen in a well, yeah, it's, it's something the vast majority of people do not have to right. worry about. If you think you're a target, again, you can run in standard mode instead of in right. administrator mode. You can disable sleep. Uh, so root, very, root pipe there. won't affect, won't, can't escalate you, for instance, that's one of the exploits. Can't escalate you if you're not running as administrator? Is uh, I fix? believe I believe this uh, exploit can't take permanent ownage if you're not running as administrator. So you need to be running, okay. So finally, a reason that, I, you know, we, I always tell Windows users, do not run as an administrative user. But I've, I've actually said, Mac users, you have a pass because Apple requires you to authenticate even if you're running as an administrative user to do anything dangerous. But this is now a reason why you don't want to run as administrator. And it's uh, I, I, these things, Apple has patched previous um, issues that are yeah. similar to this, and they're going to patch this one as, as uh, of course, some people wonder why it takes so long, but you ha you always have to check the code and then check the fix and make sure it doesn't create other problems. So you can't just rush out the patch <clears> and <throat> actually run quality assurance on the patch. Well, that uh, so raises the uh, question why they haven't fixed this uh, uh, a messages bug that allows people to uh, crash messages, sometimes even crash your iPhone by sending a malformed Unicode uh, message. People are all over doing this. I would hate to be a middle school iPhone user these days. <laughs> I spoke to them about it. They said they're doing it as fast as possible. That's another one where it's probably, a, you know, I'm going to guess it's a buffer overflow in the text rendering engine in messages uh, because it even, as you point out in your article on iMore, even works during in the lock screen. Um, so what it looks like is that there's a bug in the way that it, so these are uh, Unicode strings and it's, right. it's happened before. It'll probably happen again because there's all sorts of weird things that can happen with when you combine Unicode characters. There's there's Cyrillic, there's Arabic, there's all sorts of, of different character sets and it tries to render them and it can't. And that failure uh, causes a respring right. or a, a, a reboot uh, and that gets fixed. But who knows, like for some reason, rendering Unicode uh, is, is sufficiently challenging on a lot of these devices. Yeah. Uh, so they, if they fix the buffer overflow, that's easy. But then, you, as you say, they could have side effects that you might ha you have to check to make sure it doesn't have side yeah, effects. It looks like Cortex because it's not everywhere. It's not every app right. specific to messages, it's but cortex. it also happens in the yeah. notification center. Yeah. And the recommendation is if the, it, uh, most people's friends got bored almost immediately after doing it. So <laughs> Well, also like there's some risk because somebody did it in our chat room and his messages crashed as well. So there's some risk to yourself. Yeah, so if it happens to you, just use Siri uh, because Siri is not affected by this to respond to that message. And that will, at least on the screen that's initially displaying it, it's, it's mostly the list of messages or the actual message and notifications that uh, is the problem. That will put your reply uh, first most in that stack. And then you can show delete that the instead. conversation and you'll never see it again. Yeah, and John Syracuse had a really good point on this. He said it's happened often enough that it would probably be smart to put some sort of flag that says if you've crashed last, don't resume to the same state. Resume to a state that's, mm. uh, sorry, that, to the, to the last state, resume to a safe state. So maybe you can't go into that message thread again, but at least you'd be in an area where you could continue using the but as But as uh, Steve Gibson will point out, and he probably will next on uh, Security Now, whenever you can get a system to crash, uh, that's always a sign that, that th there's a possibility of getting an exploit yeah. around it because, you know, often what happens is it crashes, the stack pointer gets sent to a, a strange area of memory and crashes. If you could write to that area of memory, some malicious code and get the stack pointer to jump there and execute it, then you've got an exploit. And so it's very often the case that a buffer overflow that leads to a crash is uh, eventually weaponized to uh, lead to a hack. So this has to be fixed quickly, I think. Yeah, absolutely. And again, they said they're going to be fixing it as <clears throat> fast as possible. All right, let's pop that stack and recurse back <laughs> to uh, iOS and uh, OS X uh, improvements. They've said already that, uh, or at least they've intimated that iOS... Uh, was it going to be 8.5 or 9? Nine? iOS 9, 9 probably. And OS 10, 10 point, uh, 11. 11. Question mark, yeah. Will, if, it, if they're going to keep that. They will be Snow Leopard style upgrades. They'll fix, they'll improve, but not a lot of whole new. Well, there's some new features. Obviously, that, uh, that new uh, root feature is a good one. And internally, there's still 10.11 in iOS 9, but the marketing, they could decide that they're going to name them after Parisian streets from now on <clears> if they want to. Right. <laughs> No, I like California landmarks. Let's keep that, shall we? Shall well, that's we? the Mac, but the iOS doesn't have code names still. Oh. I mean, they have internal code names, like iOS 9 is Monarch, but they don't have, you know, a marketing code So they're not going to do an iOS 8.5. They're going to go to 8.4 and then go to 9? 
8.4 will uh, happen at WWDC most likely. Uh, if they if they need to, they might do 4. Point something to fix bugs right. and things. But iOS 9 will come out in September. So okay. it, and and 8.4 is pretty high. They haven't gone very high on the point releases in, in uh, recent years. Okay. They always release a new one with a new iPhone. So far, yeah. Yeah. Okay. That would make sense. There've been nine iPhones, right? Something like that. Nine nine generations, not nine iPhones. Uh, all right, what else? Let's see. So we've talked about operating systems. We've talked about HomeKit. We've talked about music. We've talked about Apple TV, uh, perhaps a new subscription service. Mm. Are we? Are I, heard, we I heard an interesting rumor that there's going to be a change in system font for iOS 9. Oh, this new uh, San Francisco up. font is going right. to be, it's yeah. going to be on uh, the, it's the watch font, right? It is the watch yeah, you font. You can open up yeah. the, yeah. Uh, which app, is it the activities app, Bren, on iPhone that shows it already? I believe so, yes. It's a and nice hallelujah. font. You know what? Yeah. It's a beautiful font. I love this font. And, and it's I'm designed really, for these really screens, glad. which is what it you is. need to, we need to also, do. Uh, also because, I mean, I'm, I've, I've been back on iOS for now for two and a half weeks, and I'm surprised by how the most, the thing that I, that I miss the most is a clear, not whisper thin font on the, on, <laughs> on my phone screen. And so if they make it, normally I'd be like, okay, fine, you're changing the font. But now I'm like, oh, I'd love to, I would love to see what iOS 9 would look like with a different font because maybe that will make me like this UI better. Andy, you really have gone apostate on us. I am shocked. I'm sorry, but I, I'm wearing Apple Watch. It, it, it tells me to move, but it doesn't tell me to sit straight. I'll, I'll try to sit, I, like, sit I'm up focused. a little okay. straight. Well, yeah. How, how, how's my apostate now? <laughs> um, is this true? The so, fifth someone, someone on Twitter. I, I gotta, I gotta, I gotta share. Someone on Twitter. I wish I could quote him. Said that if the if the if the Apple keynote goes past an hour, is there gonna be like a thousand people standing up because they're watching? Oh, just, at ten yep. at right ten fifty, we're all gonna jump to our feet. <laughs> That would be interesting, wouldn't it? I'm sorry that I can't credit him. But is it like, always? Oh. It's always at 10:50 or 50 minutes after the hour, right? If you haven't moved already, all right. of the you know, maybe you just get in your movement really quickly before the keynote starts. If they're running late, That's the lineup. Then you're good. It's gonna, be, it's gonna be like a Catholic mass. Suddenly, everybody stands up <laughs> for no reason. Says the Jenny thing Fleck, the stand up. A thousand dollars. Will everywhere. we see any watch stuff? There, I mean, there's not much to say. Hoping, yeah, the, the, watch actually, kit. the thing. Watch yeah, it. Watch it. The, the thing that I'm looking forward to the most personally isn't the music, isn't anything else. It really is Apple turning over more cards about here is what third party apps on the watches on watches are going to look like. Here's what we're going to allow people to do. We've heard about uh, Apple giving more, uh, giving direct access to sensors to enable another generation of apps. Uh, but um, I'm looking at things like. Uh, are people going to be able to uh, create like their own complications? Are people going to be able to create their own watch faces? Uh, are they going to be able to create apps that are a little bit more, uh, a little bit more mass muscular and not limited to just being a scrolling list of buttons or a scrolling list of, of things? Uh, because it's uh, it's the 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 release of the watch is not yet complete, and I don't think that. Apple Watch will be complete until we see a good, robust library of four real on-device watch apps. Uh, and Apple, of course, for now, they're using Handoff to simply have interactivity between a phone app and a watch app. But we're not seeing people design things that are intrinsically designed for a watch yet. So that's the stuff that I'm really, really interested in seeing. If we all stand up at 1050, I think we should make <laughs> the Apple Watch salute when we do. Just saying. That's the Wonder no, Woman see, version. Yes. That, that's a bad idea because everybody has their everybody has it on their left on their left hands. That's a bad visual, Leo. <laughs> Very bad visual. No rotator Dvor cuff exercises. Dvorak says this oh, is dear. the new fascist salute. Is the Apple Watch salute? Unless you put both of them on the arms of your little doggy. Are you still wearing classy. two? You're not wearing two, are you, Renee? Really? I I never wore two. When I got oh. my, the one that I ordered, I took off the one that with the oh, review okay. unit. I canceled, by the way. I really wanted that black one, but I couldn't. I couldn't justify buying another Oh, Leo. One, so I canceled. <laughs> I'm both proud and disappointed. I know. <laughs> so so what you're saying is now you have $1,100 in the budget for a new Mac Pro. Uh, <laughs> yeah, or a new 5K iMac. That's what I would probably get. Yeah. What's funny to me is that I, I fell asleep with my Apple Watch on. I forgot to take it off, and I woke up, and it was at 47% still. And I think oh, they, it's they drastically yeah. over-delivered. I so, agree. Uh, I know Jeff Williams said that they're, they're going to be showing off native apps, but my concern level for what they can do with this thing, um, 
I, I think they have way more room to actually do it. It reminds me a bit of iOS 7 where they were so cautious right. about what they allowed access to for Blur right. because Blur was so hard in the GPU. And then they just relaxed it over the next couple of months because it turned out to be fine. This might be the same thing where they knew a battery life was super important and they overshot it by so much that they'd be like, all right, cool. Just go ahead, guys. Don't be dumb. But, you know, here's here's yeah. the, the wider range of stuff. You Went can to bed with. yesterday at the end of a long day, did iOS today. So I showed the watch a lot. Used it a lot. Seventy-five percent left. It's nuts. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's, it's like if, yeah. if you, you can. I, I agree with you, Renee. You, you can see, especially in just the design of the watch faces, where it's okay. So every single watch face and every single piece of the user interface is black with a minimal piece of white on it, to, to, as small as you can possibly make it, so that you're lighting up as few of these uh, OLED pixels as you possibly can. I'm hoping that Apple at some point says we're going to create in-house a really really terrible watch face that's just nothing but like old-fashioned tv static and a cube <laughs> and, 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 a, and, a, and a pixar teapot a cigarette teapot just bouncing <laughs> rotating around let's let's see how let's see how long this lasts and if we get 12 hours out of it we will let people have fun watch faces yeah I would well, just like to see an ambient display, an always-on display, as Android does, where because yeah. it really is disconcerting that the watch goes completely black. So, so for easily. most apps, it'll, it'll leave a, like it'll leave the workout one on, it'll leave yeah. the Apple TV remote on. It, it, there's a couple that are exceptions, but it wants to make sure that you're you're doing something so active with your watch that it knows you're actually using it and don't just forget about right. it. And, you know, they right. wonder where the battery life went. Uh, here's an interesting story: the new 15-inch MacBook. Supports 5K displays. Yeah, dual link, sadly. Um, well, not surprisingly, though, right? Because didn't we say yeah. the only reason you get a 5K display on the iMac is because of custom hardware and it's right yeah. there on the board and all of that. Custom timing controller that Apple right. made. So, but the MacBook Pro will support... Uh, what, is, what does that mean, dual link? When why is that a bad thing? It's not bad. I mean, I guess it depends. I haven't tried it, so I can't personally render an opinion. I have used the old Dual Link uh, DVI cables, and basically, right. uh, one cable carries half the display, and the other cable carries the other half. And the concern when you have that is that if it's not perfectly done, you see shearing down the middle. So you're moving it in one part of the screen. I have that on my on my 4K uh, on my Mac Pro. And yeah, because some of the 4Ks. Crazy. Yeah. yeah, some of the 4Ks used to do that as well before the chipsets got to the point where they could drive, you know, even wide 4K easily. Uh, and that's the concern with this is because it's going through separate cables, you're never 100% sure that they're going right. to be totally in sync. John, what yeah. could we do with an old Mac Pro and a, four, and a 4K <laughs> display, just a uh, 30-inch 4K display? Do we have somewhere to store it? We're going to put it on a shelf? <laughs> he says it is us. <laughs> so this is Stop good news, from. though. If you got a uh, the new MacBook, that's pretty cool. You can get a... A nice five uh, K display running off of it, or since nobody sells five, does anybody sell five K displays? Dell has a five K display, but I think the pricing isn't that much different than the iMac itself. Yeah, you might so as well just buy an iMac. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah I'm more unless I'm you a, really need two of them. I'm more and more convinced that uh, I'm going to have to replace my Mac Pro with an iMac. It's kind of sad. But you I, drop I, it from low orbit I, on your enemies, Leo. Yeah, <laughs> it's but it's like a bullet. Are there are there a lot of opinions on five K versus four K? It's nice if, I, you, if seen, you want to edit 4K both. video, it's nice to have your tools because I, I I tried yeah. it on mine. And in Final Cut Pro, if you put a 4K video there, you still have room for your palettes, which doesn't sound like much, but really makes a huge difference compared to a 4K display. Well, and I'll tell you the other reason that, you want to, it. I mean, the, I, I'm, just, I'm just thinking in terms of if you have a 4K display, you have a standard display that you can basically use for the next at least five or six years. Uh, and that versus having a one 4K display plus, let's say, a 1080 display next to it uh, just for your palettes. So I, I'm trying to I'm trying to understand the the, the advantage of having one fi, one five k. The other it's well, bigger, Andy. It's you, bigger. They do want real estate, but the other advantage of five k is, is the high DPI. It's like it's like one k louder. Isn't it? <laughs> it's better. No, you're Leo's right. Full, it's a high full DPI. Full k, full k, full k, all the way up, all the way up. Where do you go? Nowhere. Because you know, on my four k, uh, I run in high DPI, which turns it into a 1920 by 1080p display. Uh, everything's big, but if you had five k, it wouldn't be quite so big. It so, looks like a regular iMac, but Retina right. when you're running at 5K, right. which is glorious. So I'm looking high, at you right now, Leo, in 5K, yeah, and you look glorious. Up. So for, well, actually, I bought the 5K for Lisa, so we have one at home, and I and I do like it. I've had enough time with it now that I, I when she lets me use it. She also has a MacBook, <laughs> the gold MacBook. She's really well equipped. <sighs> what else? Anything else before we? Uh, move on. Thunderbolt 3 uh, is going to start using the Type-C USB yeah. connector. That's, That's exciting. exciting. 
Mm. Exactly. No, uh, can, can, can you imagine that? Like of all the things we talked about today, the thing that gets all three of us saying the same thing: one universal connector. All we have to do is pack <laughs> three cables, and that's it. Isn't that great? <laughs> So now, if only uh, there will be more than one port on all of our future laptops. <laughs> Forty gigabits per second uh, over a USB-C connector using Thunderbolt. That's fast enough to do dual 4K 60 hertz displays. That also gives you charging of up to 100 watts. Uh, it also gives you Display Port USB, obviously. And uh, PCI Express, so that is an that is like all you need. That is nice. All they really had to do with the MacBook is put another one on the other side. If they had just done that, there'd be no complaint at all. I know they didn't I, do it, Leo. I don't know why they didn't do it. Maybe they can't so, do it. It's a lot of circuitry or something. It seems like it'd be. You oh, but it should be made clear that you like once uh, you won't just be able to get Thunderbolt. Like that is a USB connector on the MacBook because it has USB 3.1. It's not a Thunderbolt connector. No, 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 because, no, no, no. Yeah. yeah, yeah. This would be well, a, new, listening, you need, you a new... You need a new... Yeah, a new... A new can, it's the same form factor, but a new connector, really. Yeah. But the, but the good news is that if you... Yeah, it, it can it can just do so many different jobs in one single port. So if you, especially if you have a laptop that has, <laughs> I'm mind blowing the idea of having more than one USB C uh, connector on it. Uh, the idea of you have one cable, and if it's just a cheap twelve dollar USB C cable, it is a USB C connector. You don't have to have something special. But if you have uh, a need for a super high speed uh, 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 a data connection, you can get a super expensive, super sophisticated optical cable that plugs into the exact same port and simply does different things when it's plugged into there. Uh, it really, again, I, I, I'm, I'm embarrassing myself. I'm so excited about uh, the, the idea of just packing for a trip where I've got one sort of cable for the laptop, one mm. sort of cable for the card reader, one sort of yeah. cable for the phone, one sort of cable. It's like even even last week at Google I.O., I was like, you mean I'll be able to connect my tablet to my phone and tell my tablet to please with 100 percent battery, please charge the phone that only has 8 percent battery. Thank you, USB-C. So to clarify, in all likelihood, you won't see this until the Skylake chipset from Intel. That's yeah. the successor to Broadwell, which is just now kind of, you know, slowly getting into the market. And it is a Thunderbolt. Out. It is a Thunderbolt, not a USB chipset so you'd have to have the updated chipset the support from the uh, cpu from skylake it would the only it is a usb type c connector it does give you usb3 it does give you thunderbolt it, it gives you all the things that uh the current usb c connector gives you but it's thunderbolt not yeah. usb but that's it has all that's one of the nice stuff. yeah but that's one of the nice things about uh about how it's, it's tied to the chipset all these manufacturers are going to start sort of giving away this for free because it would cost them money, kind right. of. It would, it would almost be more expensive not to support this. It's the same reason why uh, uh, Apple had the only laptops that didn't have USB 3.0 until the time when suddenly all of them had it. it. wasn't because they had a lot of debate over whether to support it or not. It was because they weren't using the chips that have USB 3.0 built into it. So it's four times the throughput of Thunderbolt 1, twice the throughput of Thunderbolt 2. Uh, it is four times the throughput of USB 3.1, which is what you've got right now on your Type-C connector. Uh, boy, this looks great, and and because it's an industry standard, um, yeah. I think this I think this is the first one where you you really I feel like you really do have a shot at this one being universal, and I and you know can carry a PC and a Mac and a Chromebook and everything, and uh, same cables. This is great. Yeah. This is exciting, and would, boy, imagine would, the docking capabilities, right? Yeah, I mean, it it would blow my mind if Apple decided to make USB C connectors standard on iPhones. I don't know if that'll happen. Google says it's it, going it, to. Yeah, I mean, it would it would blow my mind if they it did that. It'd be lovely if it did. Oh, yeah, exactly. Oh, well, again, I, I'm again, so encouraged cable. by the fact that they put it on the MacBook. I think it might even be possible, but it, but it is the case that uh, I think Google really pretty much said that's going to be the new connector for Android in a year, maybe. Um, yeah. And that that that's going to drive us the market. And I have a feeling I wouldn't be surprised. I mean, if they put it yeah. on the MacBook, why wouldn't they? Also, also, I mean, yeah, Apple's it's... Apple's not a, Apple's not a spiteful company. Um, the reasons why they they have not used a, a micro USB. <laughs> Tell it's no, a I, Samsung. I don't, I don't, <laughs> oh, no, that's 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 different. They 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 Apple felt legitimately uh, injured, and they needed to correct what they thought was yeah. an injury. But I'm saying that they wouldn't they wouldn't 
uh, keep lightning because they feel as though we don't want to adopt this standard that is popular elsewhere. We want to retain something that's proprietary. And we want to sell a lot of these proprietary cables. The reasons why they went to lightning is because it did things that micro USB did not right. do very well. Uh, or you, see, you, you could see on, on a lot of Android devices that, hey, look, you can we have a, our own HDMI adapter that plugs in through the micro USB port, but it wasn't based on a standard. Uh, when you present Apple with a standard that they themselves had a hand in developing, right. that gives them all the connectivity that they want to have in both their phones and their tablets and their laptops, there, unless there are other uh, reasons that, isn't, that are not publicly known, it becomes a thing of are we, would we like to physically design our hardware with these connectors or are there still some, limit, some physical limitations to uh, USB-C that prevent us from making the sort of devices that we want to make? So they, they wouldn't do it simply just to be different. They would just yeah. do, they would do it, uh, they would do it uh, because there was an actual good reason to this do it. This is how you put the lie to the idea that Apple does it because they're proprietary and they can license them and they that you know they can do it because they make money as opposed to uh, there, there, there's the an upshot to this but there's always an engine there, there's almost uh, at least I'm always been aware of an engineering reason yeah. why they did something uh, and went there <clears throat> went the wrong direction and it's I, also not, it's not possible to like it's it's possible to imagine a world where the MacBook might have had a lightning port at some point and it was it was determined that the uh, the compatibility the advantage of having a standard connector on there that did very similar if not identical things far outweighed um, the advantages of Lightning, which there still are a few technical things that Lightning right. does that, that USB-C doesn't. Uh, that same equation would get run on an iPhone. It would say, what is the advantages we have, especially as we're moving, like they said with the MacBook, to a more wireless world of having the ability to do all the dynamic things that we're doing with the Lightning connector and, and to, to transiting the kind of information data we want to transit. Uh, do we still need to do that? And if we don't, what are the advantages of having a connector that's ubiquitous, that that peripheral makers are, are going to do things for other devices with. Uh, and it, it, to Andy's point, it's, it's a very simple formula sometimes. Do the pros, out, sorry, sorry, the pros outweigh the cons? Mm. It's going to be fun imagining, uh, even myself, uh, if, uh, if, uh, if, I had, uh, if I had owned uh, the, the new MacBook, I would be in a position where my Mac, my full-sized, uh, my, my, my phone takes micro USB. My tablet is a third-generation iPad that takes the old-style 30-pin uh, docking connector, and my notebook needs the USB-C connector. So it'd be like, I can't wait for 2016 or 2017 because my life has gotten very complicated. <laughs> Too many cables. Too many. It'll be nice. What a what a world we'll have. Uh, Skylight uh, Keith 512 in our chat room says uh, is probably july august so it's not so far off so it's conceivable that uh this time next year we'll be talking about uh type c adapt uh, connectors on a variety of apple stuff yeah i'll believe until when they ship now yeah. it's my only <laughs> yeah they I'll said this, when they, 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 they overstated uh, broadwell as well didn't they as we're still waiting well, i believe that skylake is on time because broadwell the die shrink was the hard part and the architecture right. change will be faster but it just question the question is are they willing to eat broadwell to get skylake to market when they right. said they would, or are they going to push Skylake out to try and make right. more money off? Right, right, right. Anything else to talk about before we take a break and get your picks of the week? Mm. All right. Going, going. <laughs> Our show today brought to you by lynda.com, a great place. If You know, I think human beings, I think if you were to describe us in, uh, in two words, we are learning machines. I think it's a natural thing. People love to learn. Kids love to learn until it's beat out of them. Learning is exciting. It's fun learning something new, whatever age you are. It's more than that. It's it's valuable. And that's why we love Lynda. Lynda.com is for problem solvers, for the curious, for people who want to make things happen. Whether it's developing an iOS app, mastering Excel, learning a new programming language, Sharpening your HTML skills or your business negotiation skills. Lynda.com has everything you need to feed that curious mind of yours. You know, we love photography. I'm a, ma I'm a massive photo buff and always looking to polish up my skills. Lynda.com has just launched a new weekly series, The DIY Photographer. Uh, Joseph Lenashki uh, teaches it. Take a look at the first installment. He teaches you how to make your own macro lens for a few bucks. That is the, you look at that. What is that, cup? Paper. <laughs> There's also new courses in uh, exploring photography, exposure and dynamic range, creating panoramas with Lightroom. And of course, we've many of us upgraded to the new Lightroom 6 and Lightroom CC. Uh, the uh, essential training is always great. This is one of the things that uh, I think Linda does so well. They work deals with companies like Adobe to make sure that they have training the day the new software comes out, when it, whether it's uh, 
you know, Photoshop or Final Cut. You you can get the training you need right away. And that's really when you need it. When the new Lightroom came out, it was like, what? Uh, 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 uh. And it was so great to be able to go to lynda.com and, and quickly scan in the stuff I need. You know, those written transcriptions tell you a lot. You can jump to any part of the uh, of the courses. There are over 3,000 up-to-date, on-demand video courses. You learn at your own pace. They're structured so you can watch them, uh, you know, an hours at a time or minutes at a time. You know, little bite-sized pieces. So you can do it on a lunch break, coffee break for that matter. Browse each tr course transcript to follow along or to search for an answer, as I mentioned. You can uh, download these and watch them on the go, including access to your iOS or Android device. Create playlists that you want to watch. Share it with your friends, kind of like Spotify. Linda, L-Y-N-D-A dot com. Your membership gives you unlimited access to every video on the site. Whether you're looking to become an expert, passionate about a hobby, or you just want to learn something new, we all do. Expand your brain. Visit lynda.com slash MacBreak. L-Y-N-D-A dot com slash MacBreak for your free 10-day trial. 10 days, the run of the place. Linda, L-Y-N-D-A dot com slash MacBreak. We love them. And I'm really, uh, I'm very proud of uh, Linda Wyman's success. She used to be uh, on the screensavers. We had her on many times talking about web design, things like that. She'd written the books on web design. Uh, and uh, now she's, what, she just sold, uh, lynda.com has been around for more than 10 years. She just sold it to LinkedIn for billions. Good for you, Linda. You can come get me in your private jet anytime. I'll go, I'll, just let me know when you're coming. We just lost Andy. Oh, there he is. He's back. Hi there. Hey there. What about Hello. your pick of the week, Mr. Andy Renatko? Uh One of the announcements from Google I.O. that reflects, uh, uh, a couple announcements from Google I.O. reflected uh, uh, are, are of interest to uh, Apple people. Uh, one of them is Google Photos, but we don't have time for a 90-minute fight about oh. <laughs> trusting all your photos to Google. I uh, love Google. I just want to say love Google Photos. Uh, I think so I think cool. it's great too. It's you, you need you, you need to have a discussion about whether you want to put all of your photos uh, uh, in the hands of a company that uh, is an advertising company. I'm okay with it. Not a lot of people. Not uh, some people aren't. Uh, I just think that if you aren't comfortable with that, make sure you understand the reasons why you're not comfortable with it, and it's possible that uh, you're turned around on that issue. But I, I respect people who just don't want hey, it's up to uh, you. that to be. It's, it's, it's up to you. I, so I, I cool. Respect. I certainly, yeah. I mean, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll tell you, but okay, maybe, okay, maybe it's, photos is going to. It's going to hurt Apple because, frankly, it does. It's not only has the same name. Actually, I'm curious what we didn't talk about they're, this. We should have terrible search terms for anybody though. If you're trying to find information on either of those apps, it's the photos. worst possible yeah. name. Yeah. Uh, well, it's pretty generic, but uh, it does all the things. It seems to do most of the things Apple's photos does only better. Or well, am I no, wrong? It, I, I wouldn't I wouldn't say that uh, because you're not sh you're not storing your photos in the original format the, the original uh, quality it's That's marginally down and we're talking about if you're using the free service also the editing tools for Apple photos are amazing uh, they're much more fine-grained and they're much more sophisticated yeah I'm a little disappointed because Google has the capability in fact Google plus had better editing tools than they've put yeah. in here I think those but are coming. But 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 it's a service, right? Exactly. This is a. I've been speaking to a lot of people at Google uh, who work on this, and there are a lot of cool things that are coming about it. But the coolest thing about it, uh, I, I basically had the stack of like SD cards from uh, every every photo I've shot over the past like three months. So I have like thousands of photos that I decided, okay, I won't, I won't trust my main library to it yet until I see what it does. But so now I've spent the weekend putting like six thousand photos on it, and then the the most fun thing is a when it decides to do cool things, like it finds animations and it finds ways to do HDR. Uh, and finds ways to organize things into albums, but also the depth of its machine learning for figuring, analyzing your photos and understanding what's in them. Uh, the first time you click into the first time I clicked into search, and I just said, "How about uh, uh, woman in blue?" And it it's found amazing. every photo in my collection of a woman wearing Here's a blue shirt, Paris or a blue dress. in the snow. I yeah. mean, <laughs> I did, I did. Well, I'll, let, let me tell you, let me tell you the, the the corker for me. I just said, "Okay, how about cosplay?" And it found wow. like hundreds and hundreds it of knew photos cosplay? of Comic Cons. Not only not only that, but then I said I saw one photo in there, so I said, okay, clear the search. Halo. And it found the picture of two people dressed as Master oh, Chief. Oh man. It was and so I, crazy. I, I, I re-downloaded that photo to make sure that no, I did I tag that? Did I put something in there? And it's like, oh my God, this is amazing. 
Uh, so it's it's worth, uh, like I said, I, I respect people who don't have that level of trust with Google. For for me, it comes down to two points. I don't, yes, they, uh, they're an advertising company, but it's in their best interest not to sell sell your actual information to anybody. That they're, yeah. they're just selling a, a position of ads to you. And secondly, if you are really, really upset about your personal information being trusted to a large company, you're, you're, you're kind of making a, 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 an empty gesture Unless you are telling me that you you run uh, the Ghostery plugin uh, on your on all well, your browsers, there you go. you're running your D, your DNS and all your mobile devices is through an anonymizer, or you're you're running Tor browser because frankly you you I feel I personally feel that I'm under way way bigger threat from ad trackers yeah. uh, and and beacons that are on every single web page than I am from Google. Uh, but again, that's a personal opinion, and I, I respect people. It, it, trust is a hard thing to really explain. I don't, I don't use Instagram. I don't use Facebook because I just don't. I get an icky feeling when I use Facebook, and so I respect people who have that same feeling about Google. But I think I, I do think that photos, they're really onto something, and it's going to get even better and better. And also, um, as there are so many good things about Apple Photos. One bad thing is how much they charge for storage. Yeah. Uh, and one of the great things about this service is the simple idea that, look, take every single photo you ever take and upload it to the service. It is always going to, excuse me, not it's always going to be free, but at least for now, uh, for the foreseeable future, there will never be any charge to upload photos if we are allowed to downsample them to 16, uh, 16 megapixels uh, and put a little bit more compression on them to make them a little bit more portable. But the, the difference between having to select which photos you want to upload to the cloud and simply saying that every photo I ever take always gets uploaded to this cloud and will always be available to me on every single device I have, whether it's an Apple device, whether it's uh, uh, whether it's a, a, an Android device, doesn't matter what it is, it will always be available to me, uh, is a pretty solid feature. Well, I downloaded the Macintosh uh, downloader, and it's been uploading. I have 40, almost 40,000 images. It's been uploading yeah. them. I'm going to yeah. have every picture, it's, every it's digital a, photo I ever took is going to be it's here. Such a, it's such a fun game, too, because uh, it's it understands what's in the picture and also particularly if you're taking pictures of like known landmarks. So it's, yeah. uh, for instance, uh, I, I, of course, I took hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of pictures at the Yosemite conference uh, that, that uh, Serenity was at uh, as well. Uh, and so it would, would automatically tag every single photo that was of a known landmark in there. So half, wow. if it had half dome in it, if it had Yosemite Falls in it, it was automatically tagged. Stuff, however, that was maybe private, like sessions inside the lodge uh, inside the auditorium, those weren't automatically tagged. Right. But even then, it took a, it took a, it took a nice sequence of like a, at the after party, uh, people behind the microphone like singing and dancing, and automatically turned make made a, a looping gif of like people dancing behind the microphone. Like, oh, that's a lovely <laughs> thing that I would never bother to create myself. Thank you, Google Photos. I love I'm the stories, uh, which has always been a part of Google Plus, but now you can create your own stories using. Um, you know, the, the pictures that are on there. I mean, it's just, yeah. you do, it's, it's such a big feature. Do nothing. We will automatically, the service will automatically find albums for you. will automatically yeah. organize and t it doesn't tag things, but it makes it very easy to locate things later. The, the, the other, the, the, well, the last like G whiz feature, and this was, it was part of the demo and it was so jaw dropping that I had to reach out to people I know who work in photos uh, at Google to ask, to clarify, did this, are you saying that, Google Photos automatically, in the same the the uh, the, the the collection of well, however many thousand photos had a picture of a newborn infant who looked to be about a day old and an eight year old girl, and it figured out that these are the same two people. That's amazing. That was and yes, that's exactly how it happens. As a matter of fact, here is here is a screenshot from my own image library of you can see like my son yeah. growing up over the past <laughs> six or seven years. And I'm like that is yeah. him. Amazing. Yeah. Uh, and just uh, again, just the ability to show me show me pictures of this person and this person is your son. And now you can just sort of start crying because it's oh look he's growing older and Try oh look at that time to remember exactly. those times in September and the cats in the cradle in the silver spoon. <laughs> and you don't even have when, kids. When, when, <laughs> and the story and the story is about how dad like won't come out and play with his son because he's too busy experimenting with Google Photos. Yeah. And, son, you, you automatically tag these things, but my little thing, dad. <laughs> you know, one of the blessings that came up uh, with this is it went through uh, my pictures of my uh, son Henry and one of the pictures it came up with was a video I'd shot a long time ago of Henry at the age of seven reading to me for the first time and I'd forgotten oh, yeah. I even had that video 
Yeah. And the that, fact that it came up with that was, if that's all it ever did. Yeah. The, the, <laughs> it's, it's, it, it's, we, we talk about really sophisticated features like matching faces and sophisticated yeah. features that are coming to iOS. But some of these, some of the biggest leverages come from the simplest things like, no, don't even bother trying to figure out if this is worth uploading or not. If there's a device you have that has pictures on it, if there's a CDR, if there's a compact flash card anything upload it it will never it will not yeah. cost you more money to add more files to this and then it's it's exactly as you say there are pictures uh that uh, that it unearthed for me or it surfaced for, surfaced for me that i forgot that i had uh and so uh i'm not sure if i'm at the point yet where i'll take it, it's, it's less a trust issue than an effort issue of going through the suitcase of hard drives and uploading everything to it uh but it's when, when you when you think about how difficult it was when uh uh, a friend of mine passed away, and uh, there, uh, and uh, someone was asking for, "Do you have old photos of uh, of uh -huh. your friend at these parties?" Mm -hmm. it, it was like going through this suitcase, and because I knew that I knew that there was a really great picture that I couldn't find yet, and I had to go search and search and search and search for it. Uh, and the if I had simply been uploading things as I go, it would be there automatically. Yeah. It was a. Uh, uh, it was. It, it was. It's a pretty cool. Pretty cool feature. Google also churns the old photos, so. Uh, stuff that I, was taken so long ago that I never made an auto awesome out of it or a collection out of it. It's going back through in time and making auto awesomes of pictures I took years ago, which is uh, the computational power. Storage is one thing. I mean, the amount of storage they must be dedicating to this is one thing, but the computational yeah. power they're I putting can, into I this. I can only imagine. I, I started. I was a little bit dis a little bit disappointed because it had only tagged. It, it only identified like maybe a dozen faces. And when I say identify faces, it doesn't know who these people are. It's right. face matching. It's not face identification. Right. And so I, gee, that, that's weird. And, and, and it was doing weird things like here is, uh, I had taken a picture uh, in November uh, of, uh, on my, on my Android Wear watch, there was a, there was a news story that involved a picture of uh, Steve Jobs and Bono. And so that picture was on my Android, my round Android Wear watch. I thought that was funny. I took a picture of it. So it, it had broken that out. And so here's Steve Jobs as a recognized face amongst the 12 it had found. But <laughs> That's pretty funny. again, I, 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 I taken at this conference in, in, in Yosemite, it's like I've got like 23 pictures in sequence just holding down the shutter button of Serenity talking. Like you didn't decide that of these 23 beautiful pictures <laughs> of like portrait like you didn't break her out as, as a different person but then it, it made me appreciate how much crunching of numbers it's doing because it took a day or two for everything to really fully populate right, right. Uh, and and it's it's kind of it's is kind of fun it's it is like having a personal assistant who's you've tasked to the job of here is every single photo that i have and i need you to organize them into like logical albums and like uh, do hdr and some of them because if you have notifications turned on for the app you will occasionally get like a, a message on your watch saying hey we have just a uh, google photos has just created a new album yosemite 2015 or now he has a new album, Trip to Boston, April of 2013. <laughs> I'm like, okay, th thank, thank you, Google Photos. I'm actually, I'm actually having dinner right now, but thank you. I'm glad you're working very hard for the money. I'm not paying you. It's funny. I, it, it, I've been just scanning through these. This, I was looking for this photo for m months. <laughs> and I just found yeah. it. Thank you, Google. Thank you again, Google Photos. So that's free. It is on iOS for the first time. It's been on Android for some time. It is partly oh, the, Google you, you, I, uh, Google Plus, but... Some of the features, the editing features in Google Plus are gone. For some reason, I don't know completely why. I'm sure well, that, they'll come back. That's, that's actually one of the advantages of this. They essentially, the, one of the bad moves that Google made a few years ago with Google Plus was essentially saying, okay, we've got a photo management service, but if you want to use that, you're going to have to have right. a Google Plus account. You're going to have to attach mm -hmm. it to this. Whereas you don't have to, they've broken all of those old features out of right. Google Plus. They've added a whole bunch of brand new ones. So you don't have to have a Google Plus account. And also there is such a deep and profound sense that you are not uploading your photos into a social media service and keeping them private. You are simply putting them in a shoebox yeah. that is not connected to a anything. Smart and shoebox. If you, yeah. Exactly. And, and if you choose to selectively Posts, send some of these pictures to to Twitter, to Facebook, to Google Plus, to whatever. You can do that, but as you're working with your collection, you are not in any way thinking if I press the wrong button, I'm going to publish all of these to my Twitter feed or to my uh, to my Flickr account. So I'm very very happy with it so far. And as I say, because it's a service, and more than that, because it's a Google service, you can pretty much expect that in the coming months and the next year or so, there are going to be even more services, uh, uh, more more features added to it, and you'll get more notifications saying that 
uh, I, I, we have, I've created a 3D immersive environment because you you took enough pictures inside this birthday party that I was able to create a an actual 3D map <laughs> of of the of the living room where the, you had the birthday cake. So if you want to put on if you want to put on your 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 Oculus Rift goggles right now, you can walk around that room. <laughs> I'm, I'm I'm sure that's coming. Look at this. This is a, a had a pictures uh, several pictures of Alex Lindsay, and obviously if you look at this picture, well, you know. That's easy to figure out. That's Alex Lindsay. But really, Google knew that that was Alex Lindsay. <laughs> I don't know how. It's a little bit scary, really. In fairness, so, in fairness, so did you, Leo. Well, I did, but I'm a human. That's easy for me. It's a lot harder. And really, they thought this was Alex Lindsay? Uh, yeah. I'm impressed. I'm impressed, Google. It was, the, 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 the other fun part is that, of course, I did a search for beard. And, of course, there's 40 pictures of Jim Dalrymple. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's... Okay, well, that that's was easy. Say. Anybody can anybody can see. <laughs> anybody can see the Google beard. for that. That's, that's yeah. really funny. Uh, Serenity, what is your pick of the week? Uh, well, let's see. Do you have one? You don't have to have Turn one. on my pick of the week. Uh, <laughs> you named uh, so your lamp pick of the week? I did. That's funny. Well, while Andy was waxing poetic about that's great. Google photos. I love it. Uh, yeah, so the you know what I was I was really skeptical about the Cassetta Wireless when I picked it up in store this morning because the box is a little crunchy and I'm I'm a little skeptical about home automation services that don't start with we and end with mo. Um, <laughs> but you know what? <laughs> yeah, uh, I actually I I really like this so far. Setting up with setting it up with my router was easy. Setting it up with Siri is easy. And if it does in fact work with Nest, which it seems to imply that it might, I'm going to go out to Home Depot and actually buy one. For for the house today and a test. If it works with Nest, then it that it is officially my my awesome nice. home kit savior. Nice. So I'm 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 pretty psyched about it. And it wasn't that expensive. I think it was like 220 for two two plug-in light switches. So you can theoretically wire up two rooms of your house with just the starter kit. Lutron's caseta, C A S Caseta Wireless. E T A. Hey look Andy, if uh, I was looking for uh, pictures of Andy and Akko. And uh, Google made a nice little, uh, here's a little little animated GIF of you <laughs> <laughs> dancing. <laughs> Look at that little R2 in the background. <laughs> Renee Ritchie, you got something for us? Absolutely. I have two things. Um, one is is for developers. It's called App Figures. App Figures has been a service that's been around for a long time, but they just launched their app. And typically, I, would, I wouldn't make like a developer. It basically lets you track how well your apps are doing in the App Store. Uh, and I wouldn't typically make that a Mac break pick. But what I liked about this is it's just, it's so delightful. I had a chance to try the beta and I wasn't expecting, like I, I knew it would be like a good crunchy developer app. But I wasn't expecting to be delighted by it, and it was a big surprise to me. And it reminded me of something Lorne Brichter of Tweety and Letterpress fame said, that when we transitioned to sort of this modern design, all the skeuomorphism went into the, the physics and the animation. And this was the same. I touched something, and it bounced, and it moved, and it, and it, it shrank, and it expanded. And it was just momentary. It never got in the way of – it never made the app feel slow, but it made the app visually interesting to me in a way that didn't involve wood or green felt. And just that sort of thoughtfulness in an app that could otherwise come across as a database or a spreadsheet um, gave me a lot of, of – of, hope for the, the the field of apps in general because i think for a while people weren't sure what to do um and sometimes sometimes very flat design became very monotonous design and if you can take basically a spreadsheet of app results and delight me uh, i thought that was hugely impressive so if you are a developer and you do track your apps in the app store absolutely check check out app figures um go to the website download the app they have a demo mode so if i don't have an app i could put in so i just hit the demo mode and played around with it and uh, more apps like this please I agree. Have you guys, you guys are familiar with Wunderlist, yeah? Yes. And Wunderlist, which is, you know, it's fun, it's ironic because I've used them all, any do and uh, uh, Gina Trapani's to-do.txt. I've gone through Remember the Milk. They're Every gym memberships, Leo. To-do apps are the gym memberships of the App Store. I have them all. <laughs> uh, but I finally settled, settled on uh, Wunderlist because it works on iOS, it works on Android. I even It even works on my uh, Google Chrome when I uh, put a new tab in. Wunderlist puts my uh, to-do list up on the blank page, which is uh, very handy. <laughs> Just for my, don't forget, which is great. Well, Microsoft bought them. Uh, I'm not sure that's a great thing, but it is probably a good time to down. They, you know what? They bought a Compli and they've turned it into Outlook for iOS and it's great. Yeah. 
They bought Sunrise. They bought Sunrise, my favorite calendaring app. Do you imagine Microsoft buying other people's apps? Like this, just, like this whole world is topsy turvy. It's a different Leo. place, isn't it? And in fact, it's funny because um, uh, they had just uh, added integration with Wonderlist, Wonderlist into Sunrise. So I don't know if that's a coincidence or what, but but my to do list now ends up in my calendar very elegantly. Wonderlist will sync with Google, my Google tasks and other tasks. Um, it, uh, it you get make an account for free. I don't. There's paid accounts, but I haven't ever paid for it, and I just uh, love it. You can delegate. You can do all sorts of things with it. Works with the uh, Apple Watch as well. So um, it's it's in it's in the news, newsworthy. But uh, I have to say, I've been using Wonderlist now for a while. Uh, it is fr it is from Six Wunderkinds, which is a Berlin uh, developer group that was bought by Microsoft. I have to think you're probably supposed to pronounce it Wunderlist. But uh, I'm gonna call this it Wonderlist. <laughs> but it's be... amazing. It's like again, like you, we're talking about photos by Google that works right. great on iOS, and we're talking right. about apps for Microsoft that work great on iOS. And it, it, again, to me, it's one of the huge advantages of the system is that because of its <laughs> popularity, but also because of the kind of users it has, everybody wants to make apps for it. And you can, like, I, I'm like Andy. I would never upload anything to Facebook or Google Plus because, by definition, they're social networks, and I prefer those things to be siloed. And I'm glad that you know Google's making a product that's siloed. I was joking around saying that I don't care about the privacy. It's the idea that they showed that Google driverless car thing and how it, the machine learning and the neural network, which is always a scary term when I saw it, when I hear it because of Terminator, but it, it can start recognizing all this stuff because of the machine learning, because of the vast amounts of data. I don't like the idea of Boston Dynamic Robots tying into it maybe, but the idea that <laughs> just all the, well, I, I saw Ex Machina last week and one of the, and without any spoilers, the basically the guy manages to teach facial expressions by, by just putting massive amounts of data about human facial expression. And that's what you need to get a machine to do anything. You need incredible amounts of data. And even if you know people say like your photos are safe, Google gets the ancillary benefits of incredible amounts of data and all their systems get better. The same way Siri gets better, the more voice data uses it. So it, it's beneficial to Google. They, they're giving us away for free, but they get huge yeah. machine learning benefits. And if they want to be the Star Trek um, computer, they need, they, they're going to need massive and massive amounts of data. So they're, they're learning all these faces. They can recognize Alex Lindsay from the angle, making a funny face with bug eyes because of all the data that they're crunching and they're uniquely positioned to do that kind of thing. I understand if you object to that, you know, everything is a pro and con. Some people object to giving Apple money for Ram. Um, and everyone can make those choices. But I, I think it's super interesting that we have access to all these options. So we can pick exactly the one that has the best, uh, drawback to benefit ratio for us personally. Yeah, I mean that's that's a, that's a great strength, and it also points out that um, every single company, I think, sincerely talks about the good that they think they can do for the entire world, and that's not marketing. It, they it's it's useful for marketing, but it is a sincerely held belief, uh, and all that all these companies that are transacting at such a high level, uh, and so it's important to understand that, but it's also important to understand that al almost no companies will articulate their vision of improving the world in a way that shoots themselves in the foot. So uh, Google will give away this service in such a way that Google will support every single service uh, phone that's out there because it's in their best interest to do so, to put to keep people playing, playing, playing Google as much as, much as they can. Uh, in the same way that uh, Apple values security and privacy, but because they have absolutely no financial interest, it's not part of their business plan. They're part of their business plan is keeping you back to buy a new premium 40% margin device every year, or every two years, which is so uh, as iPhone users, you have the great advantage that everybody wants to make sure that their service is compatible with your device. But it also means that if you do decide to invest in a service that Apple runs, you ain't never getting those photos off of a device that has an Apple logo. So if you want to switch to a different kind of phone next year or a different kind of laptop next year, that's going to be a really big problem. So that's it. There's so much calculus to 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 think about whenever you're thinking about commit making a, a long term commitment to any piece of hardware, any piece of software, or any service. I for uh, one, I just did a backup. So I have on my my iMac because I have ungodly amounts of storage. I just keep all the originals, and that goes into the the Photos library. It gets backed up to Time Machine, and I'll just point that at Google Photos when I want to try it and and do a mass upload. Because I figure Google's going to be smart enough to not care what the file names are. Huh. Yeah, maybe not. <laughs> maybe they do. In fact, they might. X nine seven three dot jpeg. See, if, if, if exactly, it's if all Facebook metadata, had baby. Service, if, if, if Facebook had this service, like I'd upload like just a hundred photos, and the next day I get a little pop up when I log in. Now, what is your relationship with P one hundred four four seven one? We think you went to high school together <laughs> once West Penobscot <laughs> High School. Can you just confirm that you went to West Penobscot High School with P one hundred four four one eight. That would be funny.
Actually, the the uh, uh, folks at Bradley Horowitz in charge of uh, Google Plus in an interview with Stephen Levy uh, gave an example of what they might do with photos. He said, right now we don't share it, but w not to say we might never do that. What if, for instance, we could determine from your pictures that you own a Tesla, Tesla were to issue a recall, wouldn't it be cool if you had a Google Now card that said, hey, you might want to check with Tesla, your car is being recalled. Yeah. See, Steve Gibson says this really well, that it's not just the company now, but it, once you give it your data, right. it's the company five years from now, 10 right. years from now, 50 years ago, because that data is not coming back. Right. They can have my data. There's nothing special about yeah, it. Yeah, but but that's a, that's a different issue. Like every, that's a that's that's certainly a valuable issue for for Radio Shack, where Radio Shack has pr had promised that well, look, yes, you're giving us your 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 location information when you buy a pack of batteries, but we will hold your your information in a vault until they go out of business. And now there's all these really valuable customer contacts that are now right. part of the assets of the company. And now AT and T uh, and these, believe it or not, you know, the uh, you have these wireless carriers that are in the unusual position of telling people you can't do this to screw over our customers because only we get to screw over our customers uh, but it's 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 uh, I, I, I that's that's part of the, the we're getting to like a two-hour discussion I'm sorry I'll, I'll, I'll cut this off quickly but uh, that's also another reason why I have less of a problem with Google than with other companies that Google if, if if I wind up living in a world in which Google is out of business or is so desperate that they need to start you know, melting down armchairs for base metal to sell at the scrapyard. <laughs> I think I got a bigger problem than rather than the, the, on, on, for society as a whole. I, it's like, will, will I have to learn how to like shoot birds with a bow and arrow for food? Because that's where the it's it's, 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 it's not it's like, the intentional stuff. It's the accidents, like when when Google Buzz would give oh, yeah. your location to everyone with Gmail. So like for me, it's not. I don't think Google will ever do anything wrong. But when you have access, and the same thing for Apple. I don't know about Apple in two or five years either. They, the more the more of my stuff they have, the greater the chance that I will be affected by any accident or dumb decision that they make. Yeah, absolutely. That, that's why this like the second thing I did after uh, after uploading all, all this sort of stuff. Um, there was no personal stuff in any of the photos from the memory cards, but of course. Uh, I, I had it on my uh, my Android phone and I had it on my iPad and so there are pictures on there and we're not we're not talking about things that would embarrass me if they were got out but you know you don't you don't if I need to uh, uh, take a if I need to make a record of a piece of correspondence uh, or if I'm just simply at a friend's house and my friend maybe did not want to this to, this photo to be anywhere in the cloud so there were like maybe 40 pictures that I deleted uh, out of the uh, out of the out of the, the place for exactly the reason that you mentioned because accidents can happen and this is a wow. brand apple and google's been in the photo business for a long time but this is a brand new rollout of a service so you're just waiting you, it may it might be smart as much as we're talking uh, positively about google photos it doesn't hurt to wait a month and make sure that you don't there's no news release about how you know customer people people are finding photos showing up in their camera roll that they didn't take and they don't know well, where they I came. thought that happened to me actually, but it was in fact photos that I had downloaded by accident. Most of my friends don't know that, that you go to Instagram and you press the location button, and if you don't right. turn it off, that you can find their house. And right. that's you know for a lot of people oh, yeah. they don't want that. And once you point it it's out, terrifying. but they just don't know. They use it, and suddenly everyone knows where they live, and uh, that kind of stuff concerns me. I guess. Yeah, I mean, that's 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 when it becomes. It, it, you don't want to be able to do a search for names and get actual place uh, places back there's there's so much there's a reason that, that's one of the reasons why i was so impressed with its ability to again in a private fashion uh detect that oh well you you took these pictures at yosemite national park because i have geolocation turned off that it, it is never embedded in my exif information because uh it is so it is too easy to accidentally uh post a photo that you don't know has been tagged with a location and then suddenly it's not as though I've got ninjas waiting for that piece of information to come and hurt me, but I just don't want, there's information that you want to try to keep private just simply as a general rule. So yeah, I don't really care. Anything they want, they can have. <laughs> I, for Except one, your welcome car, our new your keys are in the bag. Yeah, I put my <laughs> keys in a bag. That is true. My keys Mr. are Tough in a bag. Guy, take, take your keys out of the bag and say that again. <laughs> Andy Anako, Chicago Sun-Times, always a slice. Thank you for being here. Thanks. Nice to we be here. We appreciate it. We will see you Monday. It will be uh, Andy Inako, Mike Elgin, Georgia Dow, and me covering the keynote. That's 10 a.m. Pacific. We'll start a little bit before then, right after TNT. Uh, 1 p.m. Eastern Time, 1700 UTC. Monday for the big WWDC keynote. And then, of course, a week from today, we'll have lots of analysis on Mac Break Weekly. Renee Ritchie of iMore.com. He'll be in the keynote. So he'll give us the sense of the room. 
I'll be watching it. Not on, if, I will not be in stage, but I will be watching. You'll it. be no, yes, you'll be in the room. My my <laughs> yeah. apologies, yeah, uh, and and of course, Sir Redney Caldwell will be in your briefcase because uh, she doesn't <laughs> so have an invi invite invite yet, but she'll get in there. She, we I know Serenity is not going to let that uh, go. Yeah. I bet I'll just sit outside the, the main hall looking very sad. If you guys are still in town the next day, I, uh, please come up. You're invited. In your, in your Eliza Doolittle costume with a bunch of, bunch of posies. I was told I'd be All inside. Is a Governor. In <laughs> well, by a flower. Uh, you'd probably be a good Liza Doolittle. She's kind of got, yeah, she could be. I could see that. Put a little smudge of charcoal on your cheek there. I've sung those songs before. I, I bet you it. have. I bet you have. Are you guys going to be... Um, uh, in uh, town the next day, you can, we'll get you up here if you are. We will be. I think I'm doing, uh, there's a, a conference running simultaneously yeah. called Layers, which I might be in. Oh, that with. sounds cool. All right. Um, All right. I have to look at my schedule on whether or not my panels are Tuesday no or Wednesday. No pressure. But it's a, yes, design conference. Uh, yeah. It's being run by uh, Jesse Char and Elaine Strode. Yes. It's pretty cool. No pressure. If you're here and you want to, we'd love to have you. We're coordinating with Jason. Yeah. Thank you. Lady and gentlemen for being here. Thank you all for watching. We do Mac Break Weekly every, uh, yes, it's live. I reneged. I uh, I lost my nerve. I couldn't do it. So many people said, we want to see it live. All right, all right. We want to chat room. Okay, okay. So I apologize for giving you a scare. You that a was Mac me. Pro. I was just being cranky. Yeah, anybody want a Mac Pro? <laughs> Look under your seat. Uh, but so we will continue to be live and we will continue to have a live chat room. I apologize for scaring you. Uh, every uh, Tuesday, 11 a.m. Pacific, 2 p.m. Eastern Time. That's 1800 UTC. Please start uh, your Tuesdays with us. If not, of course, you can get it on demand always after the fact. Twit.tv slash MBW or wherever you get your podcasts. The new website will be up by next week. <laughs> I said that last week. The new website will be up by next week. <laughs> We're scrambling. The hamsters are working overtime. But uh, uh, if it is, you will see. And I hope you will like it. And we'll talk about it and give you a little tour of that. Thanks for joining us, everybody. We'll see you next time. Now back to work, because you know what? Break time. It's over.